This novel was possible because of Patreon member request. If you want to support this channel you can become a Patreon member and can make requests like this. Or if you want to support the author's work author's Patreon link will be in the description. Chapter 151, C-151 War. Need any help? Steve asks as he and Peggy stroll into the room. Yeah, feel like kicking some blue alien a asterisk s. Peter responds excitedly. Are they really alien? I mean they could be metahumans, right? Like James. He asks in confusion as he points to Logan. I told you to stop calling me that. Logan yells gruffly from across the room. I don't have those memories anymore. You two know each other. Peter asks as he was out of the loop. Yeah, he was a member of the Howling Commandos, James Howlett. He, Bucky, and I fought against Hydra and the Nazis together. Steve pauses for a moment as he remembers the sad loss of his best friend, Bucky. Peggy senses his dampening mood and places a reassuring hand on his shoulder, which seemed to snap Steve out of his funk. James was the only man in my unit that could keep up with me. I thought that it was just amazing genetics and training at the time, but now I know he's a metahuman. Steve says as he smiles over at Logan, who grunts and looks the other way. I see. Peter says as he looks over at Logan and chuckles to himself. Well, don't worry about Logan. He may seem all gruff and uncaring, but he's a big softy on the inside. He'll warm up to you soon enough. Just keep pestering him and he'll give up. Hearing this, Logan couldn't help but sigh in annoyance. I'll keep that in mind. Steve says with some renewed vigor. Please don't. Logan mutters to himself, but those with enhanced hearing picked it up clearly. Especially, Steve who flashed a big smile at his old friend's attitude. You may not remember, but you haven't changed. He says as he looks at Peter. So, they are aliens, right? Yep, our satellites picked up their arrival. Peter explains as he continues, stopping Steve from asking another question. And before you ask, no we don't have the object they're looking for. After quickly bringing the two lovebirds up to speed, Peggy's nods her head and speaks up. Yeah, we should attack as quickly as possible. Peggy agreed with Peter's reasoning. I'm usually not for throwing the first punch, but I agree as well. Steve follows after his lover. Besides, as you said, containing all fighting outside the planet will save countless lives. With the extra nudge from Peggy and Steve, the whole room came to an agreement. They would attack as quickly as possible. All right, what's the plan? Tony asks. Hmm. Peter took a moment to think as almost everyone in the room turned their gaze to him. Tony, get me the exact coordinates of their ships. On it. He says as he swipes at the table in front of him, causing a holographic keyboard and screen to appear in front of him. As Tony was typing away, Peter turned to Magneto. Based on the fact that their ships are most likely made of metal, your powers will be invaluable in this mission. Peter says as Magneto, who nods in agreement. Though, I'm thinking of sidelining you for this mission. Why? Eric asks in confusion. Well, I don't want the Avengers' new spaceships to be ruined. Peter says offhandedly. Instantly, Tony stops typing and turned his head with a crazy smile forming on his face. Though he wasn't the only one, a few others looked interested in Peter's words as well. Especially, Beast and Banner. You are brilliant. Tony exclaimed as all sorts of thoughts started forming in his head. We would need to take at least one of them apart for studying? Not to mention the fuel. What if they run on some sort of alien diesel? We'll have to find out what they use. Ahem. Steve clears his throat, stopping Tony from continuing his rant. As much as the thought of exploring space is exciting. Can we please focus on neutralizing the threat before anything else? You're right. Tony back to work. Peter nods in agreement. Just remember that the faster you get the coordinates, the faster we can acquire our new toys. Yes, sir. Tony gives a mock salute and gets right back at it. Though he seems to be typing a bit faster than before. I can contain my power from destroying their ships. There's no reason for me to stay behind. Magneto explains as he wants to participate in the war. That would be very appreciated. Peter nodded towards him and turns to Banner. Sadly, you won't be able to join this mission. I wasn't planning to. Banner scoffs with a self-deprecating smile. Not only would Hulk destroy those ships, I run the chance of being sucked into the cold vacuum of space. No thanks. Before anyone could reply, Tony jumps out of his seat. Got it. He exclaims as the coordinates appear on the screen for everyone to see. 20 different coordinates. All of them for each ship in orbit around the planet. Okay, suit up everyone. Peter yells to the surrounding Avengers. We're leaving in 20 minutes. Um, I don't have any combat gear. Steve says to Peter as everyone was rushing out of the door to get ready. Neither do I. Peggy speaks up next. Follow me. Leading the loving young couple to Tony's lab, Peter invites them in to find the man himself doing some last minute checks on his Iron Man armor. Huh. Tony picks up his head to see some uninvited visitors. What are they doing here? They need their equipment. Peter says cryptically. Oh, yeah. Immediately, a look of realization appeared on Tony's face as he gets up and walks to an empty wall across the room. Steve and Peggy watched in confusion as Tong tapped the wall. Suddenly, it opened up to reveal matching his and hers dark blue Captain America theme suits. Wow. Steve muttered as he still wasn't used to the futuristic technology of today's age. Though he was also awed by the cool suits as well. Now I know what you're thinking. Tony says excitedly as he taps the wall again. What about Captain America's trusty shield? Once again, the wall opened a bit more, revealing the captain's red, white, and, blue pristine disc-shaped shield. How? 
Steve asks in confusion. I thought the metal your father used was beyond rare. Oh, it is. Tony nodded in agreement as he points to the Peter. Spidey stole your old shield from your room and we reforged it. Steve turned and gave Peter an accusing look. What? Peter says a bit defensively. It was just taking up space broken at the back of your closet. Besides, now you have a perfectly functioning shield. And for the lovely lady. Tony smiles toward Peggy and gestures to the two pistols below the shield. Two matching matte black dessert eagles. We tried to make you a shield too, but vibranium is hard to find, even for me. Tony says as she walks over and takes the guns. Thanks, I'm more used to guns anyway. Peggy says as she looks down at her new weapons. Without her recent power up, handing akimbo desert eagles would be impossible. After all, they are one of the highest caliber pistols you can buy. The kick would be too much for a normal human to manage. But not anymore. UMM. Steve looks around a little embarrassedly. Is there a place that we could change? In a tiny transport ship, Nebula and a small Kree recon squad stealthily launched off of Ronan's flagship and descended to the blue and green planet below. Ronan the accuser watches the ship depart with a cruel smile on his face. He knew that sending her down to the planet was nothing but a wild goose chase. Nebula would find nothing and simply waste her time. Even she knew that. Without the Tesseract's energy signature to follow, it would take an army to scour the planet to accomplish. Sir, is it wise to treat the daughter of Thanos like this? One of Ronan's grunts asks worriedly. After all, Thanos wasn't a being that anyone could offend. Heck, even Thanos doesn't respect her. Ronan says with a small laugh. Why should I? As Nebula's recon ship left the flagship, three golden portals opened on three separate Kree ships. As portal number one opened, Professor X rolled on in alongside Nightcrawler, Storm, Beast, and Hawkeye. Each X-Men were dressed in black tactical gear with a yellow X on their chest. On a separate ship, portal number two opened, and out strolled a confident Magneto, followed by Victor, Logan, Mystique, and Natasha. They all wore black tactical gear, though Logan's had the trademark yellow X on his. Why am I stuck with you? Logan muttered, annoyed at his team placement. Shut up. Victor barks back angrily. Finally, on the flagship at the head of all 20 Kree warships, the last portal opened, and out walked Peter followed by Tony, Fury, Steve, and Peggy. Steve and Peggy donned their newly gifted suits, while Fury wore the same trench coat he always does. Tony was, of course, armed in his newest Iron Man suit. The Mark 7. Insert picture. Team 2 and 3, do you read me? Peter tapped his ear and spoke in a hushed tone. Loud and clear. Charles answers back. Yes. Eric follows soon after. Good, let the war begin. Chapter 152, C-152 Trap. As Ronan the accuser stared out of the observation deck, a nearby alarm went off, which caused the Kree grunts at their stations to start busily working. What is it? Ronan asks in annoyance. UMM, there seem to be intruders on two of our ships, sir. Someone explains as another alarm starts going off. They're on our ship as well. How did they get in? Ronan asks with a deep frown. The scans should have picked up any ships in the area, especially boarding ships. Ronan's tone was accusatory as he wondered if his followers were growing lazy and incompetent. After all, his ships are the latest and greatest of Kree technology. Their scanners could detect the slightest movement for thousands of miles. Even stealth ships stood no chance against Kree technology, so in his mind, they had to have been slacking off. As the pressure surmounted on them, the Kree soldiers got to work trying to figure out how this happened. After all, the displeased face of their leader was not something that any Kree soldier wanted to see. Many Kree have been executed after seeing that face. Sir, the ship's life signs show them appearing on Sector 5. Someone informs as an image of a hallway blueprint appears on the screen for all to see. One second the hallway was empty, and the next. Five red dots appeared, being picked up by the motion scanner in the hall. How, odd. Ronan mutters as he looks over at the armed guards at the door. Sound the alarms and retrieve the intruders. Kill them if you have to, but leave at least one alive for questioning. Do the same for the other ships as well. Yes, sir. Let the war begin. Peter says over their encrypted comms before turning to his team. All right, should we split up or... Just as Peter was talking, a loud alarm filled the hall. Well, I think they know we're here. Peter mutters as the door in front of them opens and some lasers bolts come flying out. Jumping in front of Fury, Steve held up his shield, which deflected a few of the lasers off to the side. Everyone else dodged except for Tony, who fires a thick energy beam from his chest. The larger energy beam seemed to swallow the rest of the red blaster bolts, countering the attack and pushing forward toward the blue Kree soldier on the other side of the door. Not expecting the sudden counterattack, the Kree stood shocked as the energy beam tore through their ranks, drilling a gruesome hole through one after another. As the chest beam died down, the limp bodies of the first responding Kree soldiers toppled over, dead. Damn, is that new? Peter asked in awe. Tony would usually attack with his thrusters, but his chest didn't have a thruster, so that was most likely the pure energy of his arc reactor. Yeah, the Batasium made that possible with a few tweaks of course. Tony explains. Cool. Peter muttered as they ignored the dead bodies and pushed onward through the ship. As they continued, the slaughter of blue aliens continued. With their firepower, clearing the hallways of the ship was easy work. The only one in the group that needed a bit of looking after was Fury, though he could handle himself for the most part. Especially after he looted the Kree for their weaponry. Peter felt no guilt for the deaths of these Kree. 
He knew from the movies that Ronan was a bloodthirsty warmonger, who would slaughter planets of innocent people if they stood in his way. Those that chose to follow this sort of leader deserved zero pity, though the same couldn't be said for Steve, who knew nothing of these aliens. As more and more blue humanoids were killed mercilessly, the good-hearted captain would look away from their bodies and push forward. The only thing keeping him from cracking was the fact that these were aliens, not humans. Killing fellow humans had a sort of dirty feeling about it, but aliens weren't as bad for some reason. As for Tony, Fury, and Peggy, they seemed to not care one bit. Two of them are old hardened soldiers, while the other grew used to killing in his own personal war in Afghanistan. Ronan watched on the screens, as his men, which were represented by blue dots, rushed to their inevitable deaths over and over. Each time they would engage the red-marked intruders, they would disappear from the scanner, as their life signal would end. Ronan began to grow angry as he watched in silence. How could he not? Almost 200 of his soldiers died already. For nothing. Useless. He muttered loud enough for his surrounding grunts to flinch. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Taking a breath to dissipate his anger, Ronan turned to his subordinates and ordered. Change of plans. Order those useless idiots to retreat to my position. Ronan commands as he grabs his war hammer and walks to the door. Use the hallway doors to lead the intruders to the arena. Ah, uh, yes sir. One responds as they jump quickly to comply with his orders. Leaving the room with his hammer over his shoulder, Ronan makes his way to the arena with ten fully armed Kree soldiers at his back. That number would continue to grow as he maneuvered through the halls unimpeded. Hmm. Peter hummed as they hadn't run into any Kree for a few minutes. It's quiet. Tony says as he looks toward Peter. Too quiet. You had to say that, didn't you? Peter sighs at his friend's sh asterisk tty sense of humor. What? It's a good movie line. Tony argues as the door to their right suddenly swishes open. Instantly, the group was ready for another battle. Sadly, they were met with nothing but an empty metal hallway. This definitely isn't a trap. Peter says with a healthy chunk of sarcasm. I would say otherwise. Steve says, not understanding. Do they not have sarcasm back in your day? Peter asks over his shoulder. Oh. Steve grunts in realization. Well, into the obvious trap we go. Tony exclaims as he walks down the hall. Meh, whatever. Peter says as he follows after him. Ah, uh, shouldn't we? Steve wanted to speak up against this, but Peggy and Fury already walked past him and into the trap as well. With no other option, the captain follows behind Peggy, alert to his surroundings and ready for anything. As they followed the obvious enemy plan, countless doors opened for them over and over, leading the group through the ship and down a large elevator. When the elevator opened, a giant stadium-shaped room came into view. It was a circular stadium with countless seats surrounding what appeared to be a combat area, based on the blood stains and weapons lining the walls. The elevator opened on the wall of the arena, where they could see a tall blue man with a warhammer in hand, waiting at the center for their arrival. The seats in the crowd were filled with Kree soldiers, each aiming their various alien weaponry at the open elevator. You've finally arrived. Ronan says irritably. Well, it takes time to follow a badly thought out trap. Peter comments as he walks out of the elevator fearlessly, followed by Tony, Steve, and Peggy. Fury stood behind and leaned into cover at the corner of the elevator with his new alien blaster rifle in hand. He couldn't dodge lasers like the rest of them, so he would provide cover from the safety of the elevator. Ronan seems to notice this and tilts his head to the side to peek at Fury. Oh, don't mind him. Peter says as he knew what Ronan was thinking. Fury's just a bit shy. As Peter says this, he shoots a few webs around the open elevator doors, lodging them in place. He didn't need to deal with a kidnapped Nick Fury after all. What was that? Ronan asked curiously as the doors to the elevator tried to close, as Peter thought, but sadly for them, the web held it back. Sorry, whenever I see a handsome blue man like yourself, I just start shooting web. Peter says jokingly. Premature ejaculation. Tony says with a sympathetic nod. Men are disgusting. Peggy scoffs at their little joke. Enough. Ronan roars in anger. You will dutifully answer my questions or else. Instantly, the crowd of soldiers readied their weapons. In close quarters, the intruders may have had the advantage, but not anymore. Oh, is it starting? Peter says excitedly. I think it is. Tony answers. Is what starting? Ronan asks in confusion. The badass fight scene. Peter says like it was the most obvious thing in the world. You know, the bad guy leads the heroes into a trap, the trap is sprung but the heroes fight back. Hence the badass fight scene. I'm really disappointed with this villain's service. Tony says as he puts on his best Karen impression. Where's your manager? Meanwhile, the whole crowd of aliens stared dumbly at the odd intruders. They didn't understand a single thing they were saying. Enough of this nonsense. Ronan lost his cool and points at the intruders. Fire. Chapter 153, C-153 New Hammer? As soon as Ronan gave the order, the small stadium of Kree soldiers opened fire. Thousands of laser bolts fired in Peter's group's direction all at once. Sadly for them, each of their targets swiftly dodged out of the way. Tony activated his hand and feet thrusters and shot off into the air. Thankfully the ceiling was extremely tall in this portion of the ship. As he ascended into the air, small hidden compartments on the Iron Man armor started opening up. Countless weapons appeared on Tony's body as his helmet's HUD starts to lock on to a large portion of the Kree soldiers. Lock on engaged. Jarvis' voice echoes from his suit. 
As the last Kree soldier was confirmed with a green square around them, Tony said a quick prayer in his head to whichever alien god they may follow. Fire. Tony commands. Instantly, countless bullets, rockets, and even a good amount of lasers were let loose at around one-sixth of the crowd. Bullets pierced heads with expert accuracy. Bombs were strategically fired at areas that would reap the most lives. Lasers sliced through whole rows of blue men and women, cutting them in half in a single moment. Every target that the HUD locked onto was killed without a problem. Damn. Peter muttered as he dodged the lasers and rushed toward Ronan, who was waiting with his hammer in hand. Tony really upgraded his firepower, huh? Ronan, who watched all of this play out, was both shocked and enraged. The whole point of this little trap was to cut down the unnecessary losses that were taking place earlier. Noticing the red and blue spider-themed man that was rushing challengingly towards him, Ronan turned his hatred and anger toward Peter. Once I'm finished with you intruders, I will cleanse your world with the might of Kree justice and burn it to its core. Ronan bellowed as he gripped his hammer with two hands, preparing for a fight. Why are you yelling? You mad? Peter comments as he kicks off the ground and launches at Ronan feet first. Seeing this attack coming, as a hardened war veteran should, Ronan pointed his hammer at Peter and twisted it slightly. Instantly, Peter could feel some sort of minor kinetic force collide with his leg, trying to snap his ankle before he could land his kick. Hmm, what's that? Peter thought as he eyed the long-handled hammer in Ronan's hand. Ronan is the wielder of a powerful hammer known as the Cosmi Rod, which is a large staff-like war hammer. In addition to using it as a melee weapon, he can also fire some sort of force from it to attack his enemies. Sadly for him, Peter's body is far too enhanced to be affected by some minor kinetic energy attack. All Ronan's attack did was push Peter's foot to the side a bit, though it was enough to throw his kick off course. Cool hammer. Peter comments as he flies past Ronan, missing his attack. Though that didn't mean he couldn't recover. Abandoning his original attack plan altogether, Peter pulled his fist back and punched Ronan square in his blue face as he passed by. Ronan instantly dropped his hammer and launched off of his feet as he flew into the wall across the room, smacking into it with a loud metallic thud. The metal wall behind him dented inward as some blue blood dropped from his mouth, possibly due to internal injuries. Of course, Ronan was a Kree blessed with enhanced strength, durability, agility, etc., so one strike from Peter, which would kill any lesser man, was shrugged off after a few breaths. Standing with the help of the wall behind him, Ronan seethed as he looked across the arena, but couldn't find the man that sent him flying. What he did see, however, only fed into his already explosive rage. Not only was Iron Man constantly raining death upon his fellow Kree, but Steve and Peggy stuck together and ran around the arena, slipping past laser fire and using Cap's shield for cover when necessary. Everywhere they would go, Steve would take care of the close quarters fighting, while Peggy would stick close and use her new oversized pistols to decimate the more distant enemies. Each time a loud bang would go off, a Kree soldier would drop to the ground with a .50 caliber hole in their body. Meanwhile, Fury stayed in his safe elevator, clinging to the wall. He would peek out on occasion and pick off as many Kree soldiers as he could before he drew too much attention and hit again. This would repeat over and over, as Iron Man and the super soldier couple were good distractions for him. Looking for someone, Ronan heard over his head and looks up. Standing on the wall sideways with his arms crossed over his chest, Peter looks down at Ronan with an air of amusement. I can tell it angers you that your men keep dying. Peter says as the vengeful and rage-fueled look on Ronan's face was prominent. How about you surrender and we won't kill any more Kree? Of course, they would have to surrender as well. Ronan silently seethed as the man above him offered him a way out. Surrender is for the weak and the Kree are not weak. He exclaimed and rushed to his hammer, which was only a few meters away. You asked for it, I guess. Peter mutters as he bends and launches himself off into the air. Just as Ronan was about to bend down and swipe his hammer off the floor, Peter flew over him and shot a web. As the web stuck to Ronan's trusted weapon, Peter yanked it back. Ronan could do nothing but watch as his hammer was stolen before his very eyes. As I said before, this is a cool hammer. Peter says as he lands in front of Ronan and twirls the staff-like hammer around his fingers. I used to have a better one, but I had to return it. I think I'll keep it this time though. After all, the dead have no use for material things, right? Peter says as Ronan's heart began to beat erratically as throbbing veins start to appear on his blue face. Ronan was pissed off when Thanos called him boy and treated him as a child. He was also pissed off when his grunts died pointlessly, but this was a whole other level. Kill him? Ronan has destroyed entire worlds, yet this masked buffoon wanted to kill him? You think that you could kill me? Ronan asks as if it were impossible. I am Ronan the Accuser? I have brought reckoning to more planets and peoples than anyone can count. You're nothing but some enhanced ape from a backwater world. Hmm, how did he do it again? As Ronan was ranting, Peter ignored his every word and pointed the staff forward. Is it just a movement? Twisting it slightly as Ronan did, a kinetic force fired from the staff-like hammer. Snap crack? The force seemed to connect with the ranting Ronan's neck, twisting it at an odd angle with a sickening sound. Before he could finish his long-winded rant, Ronan toppled over onto the cold hard metal arena floor. Dead. Well, I gave him a chance. Peter muttered as he walks over to check for any vital signs. Although Peter was able to pretty much bat away the kinetic attack earlier, the same couldn't be said for Ronan. Comparatively, Ronan's enhanced body was far weaker than someone like Spider-Man. 
The whole arena stilled and the fighting paused as every Kree soldier looked over to see Peter check the pulse of their downed leader. He's dead. Peter confirmed loud enough for all to hear. The rest of you can either follow in his footsteps or surrender and be spared. Choose wisely. The whole arena descended into silence as the Avengers gave the Kree soldiers a moment to decide whether they wanted to live or die. If they chose wisely, as Peter said, the surviving Kree would be imprisoned. At least until Peter could figure out what to do with them. Of course, the only other option was death. Soon, the first soldier dropped his rifle and held his hands up. This triggered a widespread chain reaction as one by one more Kree began to surrender. Traitors. One Kree yelled as he turned his gun on his own comrades and fired. Seeing this, other radical Kree started joining in as a sort of civil war broke out between those that wanted to surrender and those that would rather die. Jarvis, lock on. Tony Commander as his HUD highlighted all of the people that refused to surrender. Fire. With one last volley, Tony swiftly dropped the more radical half of their impromptu civil. The surviving Kree looked at the dead bodies of their former comrades in both shame and relief. Shame that they gave up in order to preserve their lives, and relief that they weren't the ones dead on the floor. Team 1, this is Team 2. Charles's voice suddenly sounds through Peter's earpiece. We've taken control of our first ship and captured about a quarter of the aliens on board. We've done the same. Eric speaks next, without any form of radio etiquette. Though I'm afraid we've taken no prisoners on our end. That's fine. Peter holds his hand to his ear and says with a shrug. Here. Waving his hand, Peter opens portals for the two teams to move on to the next ships on the list. Three ships down, 17 more to go. Chapter 154, C-154 Cleanup. While the two other teams started their assault on the next ships, Peter and his team started the cleanup process. Someone needed to deal with the remaining Kree soldiers, after all. There's no doubt in Peter's mind that they would probably try and escape if left to their own devices. Especially since the alternative would be leaving them in their own escape vehicles. This isn't as fun as I thought it would be. Tony says as he and the others escort the surrendered Kree through Peter's portals and into the Avengers Tower detainment floor. Just as he was saying this, the comms in their ears sounded off. Team 2 has captured our second ship with prisoners once again. Charles informs them. Same here. Eric says only seconds after. We spared a few this time as well. Good job, portals incoming. Peter says as he waves his hand and more portals appear, including one in front of Tony and the rest of his team. Go ahead, I know you want to. What? Steve asks in confusion. Well, maybe not you, but I know that Tony wants to fight more aliens, so go capture another ship. Peter says in a resigned tone as he gestures to the portal. I can handle the prisoners myself. Yes. Tony says excitedly as his helmet's face mask snaps shut. Thanks, Tingles. Hey, I told you about my spider senses in confidence. Peter protests jokingly as Tony shoots off into the portal, ready for a fight. Should we follow him? Steve asks as Peggy huffs in annoyance. Let's go before he gets himself killed. Unholstering her pistols, Peggy steps through the portal followed by Steve. Fury was currently preoccupied, so he wouldn't be joining them. Have fun, I guess. Peter shrugs as he continued escorting prisoners from multiple ships. Thankfully, the other ships haven't been notified of what's happening so far, or else they would probably escape as quickly as possible. This is all thanks to Peter, who convinced the Kree on the flagship to send out some fake messages. After all, the flagship is where all the orders come from in the first place. After sending these messages, which kept all of the Kree in the other 20 ships calm, they cut the communications between the ships, making it only possible for them to get information from the flagship, which Peter already had under complete control. Meaning, no one outside the flagship knew that their glorious leader Ronan the Accuser is dead. Though they do know that three of the ships had some unforeseen intruders, as Peter didn't have control at the time that information was circulated. Of course, Peter was sure to inform the other ships that the intruders were dealt with, before warning each ship to be on the lookout for any more possible stowaways. After all, he had to make sure everything was believable. It's not like they have a chance. Peter thought uncaringly. Of course, after misinforming all of those ships, Peter left Fury with the Kree in charge of communications. These Kree would be imprisoned with the rest when they weren't useful anymore. Of course, he had his new favorite weapon in hand, the Kree laser rifle. Who better to leave in charge of their misinformation tactics than a super spy? Peter thought, reassured by this choice. With the best of the best running disinformation for them, the war continued, but by this point, it was more of a one-sided steamrolling. It's too bad that I'm stuck here doing grunt the work. Peter thought as he continued managing portals and escorting prisoners to the detainment floor. As the Kree would flood through the portals, Peter made sure that they saw two things specifically. These two things immediately squash any thoughts of rebellion from their minds. First, as Peter escorted the Kree like a warden of a prison, he held Ronan's hammer in hand for all to see. Instantly, the idea of being saved by Ronan the Accuser became doubtful, as all other ships didn't know about his death. Second, displayed on the floor beside the portal leading to the detainment floor was the cold and lifeless body of their leader, immediately proving that planted doubt in their minds. Thanks to this small tactic of his, Peter only had to deal with some small defiance here and there. No large-scale riots took place, which he was thankful for. Of course, Peter could have handled that, though he probably would have had to kill some of them in the process. 
After all, Charles and his team left a lot of the Kree alive, but luckily, Eric's group seemed to offset this as they emptied their first ship of all life, and then started leaving a few alive so as not to look bad. Hours later and the last ship was under their control. Peter spent all of these hours stuck as a babysitter for blue aliens. I need to find another Avenger that can be the portal B asterisk TCH for occasions like this. Peter thought as he finished locking up the last of the Kree. Sighing in relief as he returned to the flagship, Peter found the battle-hardened Avenger standing in the observation deck, watching the world below in silence. Everyone seemed to be in one piece, though that was hard to tell for both Logan and Victor, who were both covered in blue blood. Whoa, you two look like someone spilled paint all over you. Peter comments as he can smell the odd-scented alien blood wafting off of them. You could have been less messy, you know. Ugh. They both grunt and don't bother answering, as Peter wasn't the first one to say something like that. That's what we all said. Tony states with a nod as he keeps his distance from the two. Are the prisoners detained? Fury asks. Yeah, though we may need to expand our prison by another floor or two. We're currently at capacity. Peter says with a tired sigh. It's been a while since Peter has gotten some rest, as he was rudely interrupted by Tony, so dealing with the boring grunt work has only made him miss his nice warm bed even more. What should we do with these ships? Charles asks from his wheelchair. Hmm, we'll have to learn how to fly them before anything else. Peter says thoughtfully. We could try to connect Jarvis to their systems. Tony offers with an excited look on his face. He should be able to learn the controls instantly. What if it's all in an alien language? Peter asks as he contemplates that idea. I think he can figure it out. Tony says with a shrug. Fine, you work on that. Peter says as he turns back to the other Avengers. The rest of you can return to the tower and relax. What about you? Tony asks before getting to work. Off to bed. No, I have a planet full of people to calm down. Peter says as he sighs in annoyance. We don't need any nukes launched at our new ships after all. Receiving a sympathetic nod from Tony as he gets to work, Peter waves his hand and leaves with the rest of the Avengers. Only Tony remained on the flagship. Are we sure it's a good idea to leave him in space, alone? Charles asks as the portal closes behind them. Yeah, won't he drift off or something? Clint speaks up as well. No, he'll be fine. Peter says with a shake of his head. The ships are all in orbit, so they won't just fly off. Unless he does something stupid. Back in space. Okay, Jarvis. Tony says as he looks between all of the alien controls panels. Let's take this all apart and make a port to connect you. As he didn't have any of his tools, Tony used his Iron Man suit to rip the control panels apart and study the insides. Sparks fly as he tears apart the control room without a care for any of the possible consequences. But Tony's smarter than that? Peter says as many Avengers give him skeptical looks. Yeah, you're right. I'll check on him once I'm done calming the masses. Good idea. Fury nods. All right, off I go. Peter says as he turns to Fury. Can you start questioning our new alien guests? We could use all of the information we can get. Yeah, I'll start now. Fury nods as he walks out of the room followed by Natasha and Clint. Leaving the rest of the Avengers to do as they pleased, Peter left the room and took out his phone. Checking Twitter as he maneuvered through the tower's halls, Peter found everyone freaking out about Ronan's message. I should have posted something earlier. Peter sighed as he wrote a tweet. At Spider underscore man. Press conference at Avengers Tower in 30 minutes. Just as things were calming down on Earth, the Chidori army soared through empty space, trying their best to catch up to the faster Kree army. 10 hours, 23 minutes, and 39 seconds. Chapter 155, C-155 Countdown. 9 hours, 40 minutes, 52 seconds. Standing at a podium in a room filled with cameras and microphones, which were all pointed in his direction by various members of the press, Peter started explaining the latest mission that the Avengers undertook. Hello, everyone. Peter says as he waves, his image being broadcast across the world. Before locking up the Kree that helped spread misinformation for them, Peter had them shut down the replaying message that looped all over Earth. If he didn't, then this whole press conference would be blocked, making the whole thing pointless. I'm going to get straight to the point and then leave to deal with other things, so listen up. Peter says as he was too tired to deal with the questions of hungry reporters. The alien army that was threatening our planet through our TVs and radios has been dealt with. They were in orbit around our planet, waiting to invade. We, the Avengers, acted quickly and launched an attack before they could enter Earth's atmosphere, as that would keep all of you away from the fighting. The world was shocked, as most people didn't actually believe in an alien invasion. They thought it was some sort of hoax orchestrated by some hacker or something. Even hearing the words from Spider-Man's mouth didn't sway many of them, as it was just too outlandish of a tale. Peter went into a little more detail and explained about the Kree and Ronan the Accuser, though he didn't say much more before walking off stage. That's it for now. When we have more information, either I or Tony will call another one of these. Peter says as he waves and walks off. I can hear my bed calling for me. Wait. One of the more loudmouth reporters yells as they step in front of the crowd. You really expect us to just believe all of this without a single shred of proof. This seemed to incite the other reporters and journalists in the crowd, as they all started shouting their own questions. I said no questions, didn't I? Peter thought in annoyance as he sighed and walked back to the podium and glared at the crowd under his mask. Quiet.
Peter didn't raise his voice, but the annoyed tone along with the dangerous feeling he was radiating at the moment seemed to scare the crowd into silence. Tony is currently doing his best to figure out how to fly the Kree ships that we commandeered. Peter says with complete confidence. In space, sparks go flying as Tony sat in the middle of hundreds of alien wires from the destroyed control panels of the flagship. Hmm, not that one either. Tony mutters to himself as the lights on the ship suddenly shut down, leaving him in darkness. That's not good. I'm sure that many of you will see them when we bring them down to Earth. As for other forms of proof, we have many survivors from the battle that are currently detained and undergoing interrogation as we speak. Maybe we'll release some recordings from these interrogations later. Peter says with a shrug, shutting down the doubters for the moment. Now, I have to get back to the tower. See ya. This time, the crowd was silent as Peter walked off stage, leaving them with the idea that aliens actually may have planned on attacking them. The same could be said for many around the world as well. 8 hours, 49 minutes, 39 seconds. In a dark interrogation room in the tower, Fury sat across from a chained Kree soldier, neither said a word as Fury just stared at him in silence. Using his plethora of experience, Fury first set his sights on the more cooperative Kree, dragging them in and out, looking for the one that would either brag about themselves or break and start spilling everything. Either way, he would get the information they needed. He could have just started torturing the Kree, as they weren't humans or from Earth, so technically, they had no human rights. Too bad torture is unreliable. Fury thought as he waited for the Kree before him to speak first, continuing the staring contest. Torture in interrogation yields poor information, as the victim would say, and admit to anything just to make the pain stop. Not to mention the fact that it sweeps up many innocents. The soldier you're drowning, cutting, or starving could just be a man that was drafted and forced into service. The possibility of torturing an innocent prisoner just wasn't worth it. Though there is a time and a place for torture tactics, though that's in extreme and dire circumstances, but this wasn't one of those situations. Are you just going stare at me all day? The Kree finally asked. Yes, now why did you come to my planet? Fury answered and throws out his first question. The Kree man stays quiet, refusing to answer. Was it actually the Tesseract? Or was that just a ploy Ronan cooked up, so he could justify invading a peaceful world? Fury asks pointedly. Justification. The Kree laughs as the chains tying him down rattle. We do not care whether your world is peaceful or not. The Kree take what they want. The question is whether the other party hands it over respectfully, or well, you heard Ronan's words in the message. Yeah, but he's dead now. Fury comments as he places a picture of Ronan's dead body on the table. Instantly, the Kree prisoner starts to glare as he looked toward the picture of his former leader. Ronan's head was snapped sideways and a bone could be seen poking through his neck. For some big bad alien warlord, your leader died almost instantly. Fury says, purposefully angering the alien across from him. It was so anticlimactic too. He was ranting about how he couldn't die, then my comrade used Ronan's own weapon against him and snapped his neck like a twig. This Kree was from a separate ship, so he was just learning about what happened to Ronan. You know nothing about Ronan the Accuser. The Kree see that as he pulled on his restraints, trying to attack Fury who was completely unfazed. He is the perfect Kree. Ronan embodies all of our most sacred ancient customs. Well, I think you mean he was the perfect Kree. Fury continues poking at a hornet's nest. Truthfully, from your explanation of him, I was expecting more. After all, he died so easily. Shut your mouth you dirty ape. The Kree bellowed hatefully as he strains against his chains. You know, I've been called some pretty racist sh asterisk t by a lot of humans, but never an alien. Fury commented as he found this scenario entertaining. Watching from the cameras, Natasha and Clint couldn't help but gape at what the Kree said. Can an alien even be racist? Natasha asks with a thoughtful look. Probably, but I think he was throwing that insult at all humans, not just well, you know. Clint replies as they go back to watching the monitor. Seeing that the man before him found his outburst funny, the Kree continues to thrash against his restraints for a moment before finally giving up. Heavy breathing. You think, it's over, don't you? The Kree says as he catches his breath. You think, your planet's safe. Fury doesn't answer and waits for him to explain. We were only the first to arrive. The Kree says with a triumphant smile. When Thanos' army descends on this pitiful planet, you apes won't stand a chance. Who's Thanos? Fury asks but the smug Kree refused to speak any further. 5 hours, 20 minutes, 55 seconds. A golden portal opens in the dark flagship's control room, illuminating the destruction that Tony inflicted on the poor ship. What the? Peter mutters as he steps through. A few seconds after he stepped through, the lights suddenly flicker back on, lighting up the whole place. Yes. Tony yells as his head pops up from below the floor. Let there be light. I see that you've trashed the place. Peter reveals himself as his portal closes behind him. Oh, Peter? Where have you been? Tony uses Peter's real name, as no one else was around. I had a press conference to calm the masses and took a quick power nap. Peter reveals as he looks around the destroyed room. Otherwise I may have snapped upon seeing this mess. Well, I have to connect Jarvis somehow. Tony says with a shrug. Right. Peter says as the speakers in the ship go off. Jittle mage mug how I got h jot hall, chi hall, picky hawk g h idol, gobby w a d h so. Vaj e j g h idol hi, jot hi chi i ak e j gobby da s o v. Mug mage sag hawk gobby. A weird angry sounding alien language plays through the ship's control room. 
Where is that coming from? Peter asks as Tony looks at the mess around the room. I have no idea. Chapter 156, C-156 Avengers learn about Thanos. Where is that coming from? Peter asks after hearing the odd alien language. Is it the Chidori? I have no idea. Tony asks as the ship goes silent. Though I think we should find out. Hey, you think? Peter says sarcastically. The Chidori are a sentient species of cybernetically enhanced beings. Most of them are simple-minded dogged creatures, similar to insects, operating under a hive mind intelligence. They are the personal army of Thanos, which he mainly uses to throw at his enemies or call half the population of entire planets. Whatever the job may be, as long as it pertained to war and death, the Chidori will follow the Mad Titans every order faithfully. Let's get to work, I guess. Peter says as he starts to familiarize himself with the exposed control panels. Give me a quick rundown on what you figured out so far. While Peter and Tony put their heads together to, hopefully, get the ships moving, Fury spent hours interrogating as many Kree soldiers as he could. Through these long hours of unending questioning, he started to get a good picture of what was happening. Who's Thanos? Fury would ask every Kree the same question. Most would clam up and refuse to speak, each of them too scared to say a word, which was odd as the Kree seemed fairly confident in every other area. It was only the name of the Mad Titan that seemed to bring out this collective fear in all of them. Though that didn't mean Fury didn't get an answer to his question. Out of the thousands of captive Kree, one of them had to break. The Mad Titan isn't someone you should be asking about. A more talkative Kree woman said in a hushed tone. Why? Fury asks curiously. Mad Titan. Thanos is one of the strongest beings in the universe. You may have beaten us and Ronan the Accuser, but when it comes to Thanos, even the Great Kree and Nova Empires must be respectful. Otherwise, the consequences would be astronomical. She explains with a trace of fear in her tone. Of course, since Fury found a cooperative Kree soldier, he made sure to milk her for all of the information she had. Sounds like a scary man. Fury comments as he asks further. Is it true another army is coming? Yes, a small portion of the Mad Titan's personal army. She goes on to give a small explanation about the Chidori. You should leave this planet while you can. Encountering the Chidori is a mark of death. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose this battle. Thanos already set his gaze on your planet. If his army fails, he'll send another or worse. Worse. Fury asks, loving how open this Kree is being compared to the rest. He could visit this planet himself. She says as a shiver runs down her spine. Either way, I'm sure we'll be killed for our failure. Huh. Fury grunted as he leaned back in his chair. How long until this army gets here? They were supposed to arrive 18 hours after our arrival. She answers without trouble. Instantly, Fury realized that they were on a short clock, as they had a bit less than 5 hours before another alien army arrived at Earth's borders. How many ships do they have? He continues fishing for information. The same number as us, I think. She says after a moment of thought. I don't know much though. You'll have to ask Nebula for more details. Who? Fury asks with a raised eyebrow. Thanos' daughter. Speaking of Nebula, the unloved daughter of Thanos and her Kree subordinates are currently occupying the house of a married couple that are out of town for their anniversary. They spent the day infiltrating various government buildings, searching for any clues that could lead them to the Tesseract. Sadly, their efforts bore little to no fruit. Sure, they learned about plenty of government facilities, though they wouldn't know what was inside until they start poking around more. As the Kree stealth squad was raiding the kitchen for food like a bunch of animals, Nebula sat on the couch and familiarized herself with the TV. These humans really need to update their technology. Nebula comments as she flips through the channels. What's this? A man in spider-themed clothing stood on a podium surrounded by a crowd of eager people. The alien army that was threatening our planet through our TVs and radios has been dealt with. They were in orbit around our planet, waiting to invade. We, the Avengers, acted quickly and launched an attack before they could enter Earth's atmosphere, as that would keep all of you away from the fighting. Impossible. Nebula thought in disbelief. Suddenly, a Kree soldier who was in hearing range dropped a cooked chicken leg onto the floor and stared at the TV in shock. Lies. He exclaims, drawing the attention of the other Kree. Our army would never lose to these apes so easily. After playing that clip, a news anchor started speaking. Spider-Man, Earth's most loved hero and co-founder of the Avengers, says the alien threat has been dealt with. As the newswoman says this, the newly arrived Kree watch in shock. Some were skeptical of his claims, but he had this to say. The screen changed to a similar clip, except this time the oddly dressed man was talking about commandeering Kree ships and interrogating the surviving captives. How dare they spread lies about our army? A Kree says through his grinding teeth. Hmm. I don't think he's lying though. Nebula thought as she wondered what to do now. We should return to the ship. One of the Kree voices their opinion. Rona needs to hear of this. What if he isn't lying? Nebula asks thoughtfully. No one had an answer for her, though they all thought that was highly unlikely. That doesn't matter. One of them says angrily, as he glares in Nebula's direction. We're returning to the ship. Ronan the Accuser wouldn't lose to some weak backwater planet. Nebula seethed as she was treated harshly by some random grunt. This is all due to Ronan's attitude toward her. He disrespected her at every moment he could, and now his subordinates have learned to do the same. Look at me like that again, and I'll cut you into tiny little pieces. Nebula earns as she takes out a knife from her belt. 
After all, her father wouldn't care for the loss of a random Cree nobody. Humph, try it. He counters and draws his laser pistol. Without another word, Nebula flicked her hand and launched the knife across the room. Before anyone could react, the knife flew into the disrespectful Cree's left eye, piercing straight into his brain. As he lifelessly collapsed onto the floor, the other Cree grabbed their weapons tightly and aimed at her. Clean this mess up and meet me at the shuttle. We might as well check for ourselves if Ronan lost or not. Nebula says as she walks out of the house, ignoring the guns pointed at her the whole time. Is it wrong to hope that he's dead? Time slowly passed as Fury extracted as much information from the captives and called the Avengers to assemble once again. Just when they thought the threat was taken care of, another alien army was only hours away. Though two people didn't get this message, as they were currently in space. Tinkering with the ship's control panel, Peter and Tony worked steadily to figure out the many wires and started working on a port that Jarvis could connect to the ship through. After a couple of hours of work, in which Peter had to make a few trips to Tony's workshop for supplies, the two were only a few steps away from completing the port. Connect the blue wire next. Tony backseats Peter's work. No, it's the gray wire, you idiot. Peter comments as he grabs the gray wire. No, the gray wire connects to the scanners, not the databanks. Tony corrects with a huff. How much do you want to bet? Peter asks with a challenging look. $100,000 and a single tweet from the other's Twitter account. Tony offers, accepting the challenge. Deal. Peter says as he grabs the blue wire and plugs it in. Instantly, the monitors in the room started lighting up, as the scanners started to pick up a million non-existent intruders on board. Looks like I win. Peter says as he replaces the blue wire with the gray one. I only take cash, by the way. Whatever, just hurry up. Tony started pouting like a child. Finishing the last few tweaks, Tony was finally able to plug Jarvis into the newly made port through his phone. Good luck, buddy. Tony says as Jarvis code floods through the port and into the ship. Connection secure? Jarvis voice plays through the ship's speakers. Accessing ship's databanks. Haha. <laughs> Tony laughed triumphantly. It worked. Translating foreign alien coding and language. 1%. 2%. 3%. 4%. Dot. 1 hour. 57 minutes. 07 seconds. Chapter 157. C-157 Firepower. Translating foreign alien coding and language. 1%. 2%. 3%. 4%. 25%. 50%. 75%. 100%. 100%. Jarvis kept them updated through the speakers of the ship. Good job, buddy. Tony says as he pats the wall of the ship proudly. Anything we should know? Peter asks Jarvis. Yes, I now have full control over all 20 Kree warships. I can control each of them from the flagship. Jarvis answers. Well, at least the mess Tony made didn't affect the ship much. Peter says as he turns a quick glare at the man in question. What? We would have replaced the controls anyway. They were all labeled in whatever language the Kree write in. Tony says with a shrug. That is not all. Jarvis says as the remaining monitors in the room play a recording from the databanks. How much longer until we arrive? Security footage of Ronan and Nebula speaking appears on the screen. Nebula is here. Peter confirmed his earlier suspicions. Did she die in the battle? Peter would have remembered seeing her with the prisoners, as he was the one that was in charge of that. 37 hours. Though we can half that if we increase speed and leave behind the slow Chidori ships. Nebula answers as she glares hatefully at Ronan. Hmm, do it. Ronan commands. What? Nebula asks. Increase every ship's speed to maximum. Ronan turns and walks to the door, passing Nebula along the way. Half of our army will arrive late, but that won't change the outcome. The screen goes black as the video ends. He's right, it didn't change the outcome. Tony says with an air of confidence. We still would have won either way. Jarvis, I'm guessing that odd language was a message from the Chidori? How far away are they? Peter asks. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers respectfully and dutifully. The message from earlier can be roughly translated to a report on their arrival time. We have around an hour and a half until 20 Chidori warships arrive. Okay, do our new ships have any firepower? Peter asks as a wide smile blooms on Tony's face. Hee hee, I like the way you think, Webhead. Tony laughs excitedly. Yes, each of the Kree ships is outfitted with hundreds of missiles as well as a couple of high-powered beam weapons. When it comes to defense, there's a kinetic shield that can be activated during combat. Though, the shields will drain the power of each ship fairly quickly. Jarvis explains everything he learned about the ships. Peter doesn't say anything as he and Tony turn to look at each other, smiling like two maniacs. All right, Tony. You work on our battle strategy with Jarvis. Peter says as he opens a portal to the tower. I'll go and gather our forces, just in case. As Peter was walking into the portal, he turned around and looks back for a moment. Jarvis, where is that woman from the video? I don't remember seeing her among the dead or the prisoners. Peter asks with one foot inside the ship and another in the tower. One moment. Jarvis says as he searches the ship's databanks. She and a few Kree were sent down to Earth to investigate the whereabouts of the Tesseract. She didn't return. Peter asks. No, sir. Jarvis answers swiftly. Okay, if she does return, can you trap her in the ship? I want her alive. Peter says, receiving a knowing smile from Tony. I thought you had a girlfriend. Tony says with his infuriating smirk. 
Though I understand the appeal of a sexy blue alien. Not everything is about sex, you old perv. Peter says, happy that he can finally use Tony's age against him. After all, if he made age jokes before, Tony would have known Peter was younger than he portrays himself. At least I'm not a middle schooler. Tony yells back as the portal closes, leaving him and Jarvis alone on the ship. So, tell me more about these high-powered beam weapons. Arriving in the tower, Peter checked his phone and found a bunch of missed calls and messages from different members of the Avengers. Jarvis, where is Fury? Peter asks as Jarvis is integrated with the entire tower. He and many other Avengers member are currently having a strategy meeting. Jarvis says and gives Peter the location. Walking into one of the large meeting rooms, Peter felt a bout of deja vu come over him, as every member was here once again. Let me guess. Peter says as he waltzed into the room, instantly drawing everyone's attention. You guys learned about the second army headed our way. You're late. Fury says angrily. We've known about this for hours. Natasha says with a roll of her eyes. Good for you. Peter says as he waves his hand and creates a portal to the ship. We have a bit more than an hour before they arrive so let's go. We haven't decided on a plan yet. Charles says from his wheelchair. Tony and I already have that covered. Peter reveals as he gestures to the portal. If you don't want to miss the fireworks, then come on. Sighing in annoyance, Fury was the first to step through the portal, followed by everyone else. Stepping in behind them, Peter closes the portal. Stark, what's the plan? Steve asks as he and everyone else freezes at the mess that was once a pristine control room. Just as Tony was about to answer, a soft alarm went off, filling the control room. Sir, a shuttle is docking onto the flagship. Jarvis informs them as the alarms stop. Is it the woman from the video? Peter asks, ignoring the curious glances from those that just arrived. Yes, sir. Would you like me to lock them in the shuttle? Jarvis asks dutifully. Yeah, just make sure they can't detach from the ship either. Peter answers with a nod. Done. Jarvis says after only a second. Shuttle locked in place. What's going on? Nightcrawler voices everyone else's thoughts. I'll explain later. Peter says as walked to the door. Jarvis, lead me to the shuttle. Yes, sir. As their shuttle docked on Ronan's flagship, Nebula clicked her tongue in annoyance. Looking over at the dead body laying motionless on the side, she rolled her eyes hatefully. I tell them to take care of the body and these idiots bring it with us. Nebula thought with a disgruntled sigh as a decaying smell filled the small shuttle. The shuttle shook as a loud clang was heard, locking the shuttle to the much larger ship. Preparing herself for what's to come, Nebula stood up and hit a button next to the sliding doors. Instantly, a red light appears under the button and the door doesn't budge. What the? Nebula mutters as she taps the button once again. Nothing. The door stays sealed shut, leaving them trapped in the tiny shuttle with a decaying carcass. Open the damn door already. One of the Kree yells toward Nebula. What do you think I've been doing? She turned to glare at the idiot behind her. Move out of the way. Another says as he pushes forward and hits the same button to no avail. It's locked. No sh asterisk t. Nebula says as she pushes forward. Let me see what I can do. Suddenly, Nebula's hand turns into a sort of alien multipurpose tool, which she uses to take the panel beside the door apart, revealing the many wires hidden underneath. Just as she was about to start messing with the door's controls, it suddenly swung open on its own. Huh? You did it. A Kree asks in surprise. No, I didn't. She admits and looks out the door. Hello. A foreign voice says. Peter stood outside the door in his blue and red spider suit, waving toward the newly arrived aliens. Held in his right hand was the hammer that once belonged to Ronan the Accuser. That doesn't belong to you. One of the Kree noticed the hammer and points his gun menacingly. Well, it does now. Peter says with a shrug. The old owner won't be needing it anymore after all. They seemed to understand what Peter meant, as the more hot-headed Kree started firing at him. With a quick swipe of the hammer, Peter shot some kinetic force at the incoming laser bolts, knocking them to the side with ease. You, step to the side. Peter motions for Nebula to get out of the way. Deciding to trust her instincts, which were currently screaming at her to listen to this stranger, Nebula exited the shuttle and stood at the side, leaving the remaining Kree inside. Thanks. Jarvis, do it. Peter says and the doors to the shuttle swiftly snap shut. Open the airlock. In the shuttle. As the Kree were getting ready to shoot the door open once again, the second pair of doors behind them opened, sucking them into the cold vacuum of space. From a nearby window, Nebula watched as the dead bodies of the Kree that she spent the day with floated out into space. What happened while I was gone? Chapter 158, C-158 Rebellious Decision. This way, Peter says as he turns his back and walks back the way he came. Nebula stared at his back in silence, contemplating whether she should attack or not. After all, she still had all of her weapons, and even if she didn't, her body is practically a living weapon thanks to her dear old dad. Though she seemed to miss her window of opportunity, as Peter turned around and waited for her to follow. Come on. We'll miss the show if you take too long. Peter says, confusing Nebula even further than she already was. Nebula simply stared for a moment before finally following after Peter. As they traversed the large ship, Peter made some small talk. What's your name? Pete asks as he points to his mask. I can't tell you mine, but you can call me Spider-Man or Spy-Day for short. Why? She asks, feigning disinterest. Well, I fight crime on Earth, so I try to keep my identity a secret. 
That way my family and friends can live their lives without worrying about retaliation from whoever I happen to pee asterisk SS off in the process. Hmm, I see. She answers without much enthusiasm. Nebula. Hello, Nebula. Peter says excitedly as he starts digging for information he already knows. Why were you with these Kree? She doesn't answer this time. Because based on the way you were looking at Ronan in the security footage, I could tell that you hated his guts with a fiery passion. Peter says as she rolls her eyes at his obvious observation. He's dead now, by the way? Really? Nebula asks uncertainly. Yup, I did it myself. Peter says as he spins the hammer between his fingers. I wish that I could have seen it firsthand, or killed the B asterisk starred with my bare hands. She comments with a hate-filled look. So, are you a cyber woman or something? Peter asks, hoping this question would draw on her daddy issues and get her talking about Thanos. Why, do you think I'm ugly too? Nebula spat out angrily. No, I think you're quite beautiful, but sadly for you, I'm a taken man. Peter says as he turns to look at her. Why, do you think you're ugly? Nebula goes quiet as they stand unmoving in a metal hallway. I didn't use to look like this. At one point, I was completely flesh and blood. Huh. Peter says as he smiles under his mask. I didn't think you'd open up like that. You seem very, prickly. Shut up and keep walking, spider boy. She says with a huff and a glare. It's Spider-Man. Peter says as they walk the rest of the way in silence. Finally arriving at the destroyed control room, Nebula caught sight of the entire Avengers crew. Yo, this is Nebula. Peter says as they enter the room. Thanos' daughter. Fury asks as everyone becomes alert at the drop of a hat. How do you know that? Nebula asks back as she grips her pistol tightly. Slap. Before anyone could get serious, Peter slapped Nebula on the back of the head, causing her to loosen her grip on her pistol and glare in his direction. No fighting. Peter orders. You know that's apparently the daughter of the man that sent these armies here, right? Peggy reveals with a concerned look. Now I do. Peter says with an uncaring shrug. Though we won't be fighting. She's my guest. At least, for the moment. Many people didn't seem to agree, as even Nebula looked at Peter with a funny look on her face, though he ignored all of them. Jarvis, what's the Cheetorai's arrival time? Peter asks. 13 minutes, sir. They've already entered our solar system. Jarvis answers dutifully. Have you and Tony made the strategy? Peter continued his questions. Yes, when the Chitori arrives, we will hail them, pretending to be a Kree officer. I'll relay orders for them to take a certain position, and once every ship is in our sights, we'll launch the attack. Jarvis explains. Good, since we don't know what type of defenses they'll have, double whatever firepower you already plan to use. Peter orders after a second of thought. Tony can always make more missiles. After all, it's his family's specialty. Hey. Tony yells from across the room. We don't do that anymore. Really? How many missiles are in your suit right now? Peter asks as enters a thinking pose. Let's not even get into how many more Iron Man suits you have, which all probably have missiles in them as well. Okay. Maybe I still do that, but I don't sell them anymore. Tony gives in to Peter's logic. I never said you did. Peter shrugs as he looks out of the large observation window. Is that their ships? Far off into the black void of space, Peter could see tiny specks getting larger as time went by. Yes, that's the army my father gave to Ronan. Nebula reveals as she steps up beside Peter. Jarvis, positions. Tony commanded. Yes, sir. His trusty AI replies. Instantly, every Kree ship fired up and sprung to life, maneuvering into predetermined locations. As this was happening, Peter and everyone else watched the incoming fleet get closer and closer. Similar to the Kree fleet, the Chidori seemed to have a flagship as well. While the other 19 ships were around the same size as the normal Kree ships, the flagship, so to speak, was probably about two or three times bigger than Ronin's. Oh, yeah. Peter remembered something as he saw the giant spiky bug-like ship. Wasn't that the ship that controlled all of the soldiers and other ships? In the Avengers movie, the Battle of New York ended when Iron Man took a nuclear missile that was meant to hit Manhattan and redirected it through the portal linking Earth to Thanos' domain. The nuclear missile then obliterated the Chitori command ship, which controlled every Chitori and Leviathan, causing them to die all at once. Should we just destroy the command ship and steal the rest? Peter wondered, though he didn't know how to explain where he got his information from. Whatever, we have enough ships. We can always collect the scrap from their ships for research. Thinking of this, Peter turned to Magneto, who was watching the different alien armies arrival. Eric, can you collect the scraps from their ships? I don't want any of it to fall to Earth or get stuck in orbit. Peter asks. Yeah, we can study it too. Tony says excitedly. Sure, no problem. He agreed easily. As they were talking, the alien armada got close enough for Jarvis to make contact, relaying orders to enemy ships. Jarvis says as he goes silent. Within minutes, the Chitori ships break formation and maneuver into a new trajectory, following Jarvis' false orders. It worked. Tony says, vibrating with excitement. It's wonderful when a plan comes together. Peter mutters as Nebula watches her father's army fall into a trap. Weirdly enough, she didn't feel the urge to help or warn them. In fact, Nebula felt eager to see the downfall of her father's carefully thought out plans. The destruction of her father's army incited the burning vengeance that Nebula has been keeping under control for all of this time. You don't like your father very much, do you? 
Peter asks as he sees the hateful look on Nebula's face as she glares at the incoming army. I hate him more than anyone in the infinite universe. She admits in the moment. Hmm, is he the one that did that to you? Peter asks, pertaining to her cybernetic upgrades. Yes. She answers curtly. Want to get revenge? Peter asks like the devil with an offer for her. Yes. Nebula admits through clenched teeth. Enemy army in place. Awaiting orders. Jarvis says as the Chidori fleet stops downrange from the Kree ships. Shields up and weapons ready. Peter orders. Shields booting up. Jarvis says as each Kree ship glows in a blue light. Shields ready. Missiles ready. Beam cannons charging. You said you wanted revenge, right? Peter turns back to Nebula. I do. She answers resolutely. Weapons ready. Jarvis informs everyone. Then order the attack. Peter tells her, getting shocked gazes from everyone in her room. Destroy your father's fleet as the first step of your revenge, and we'll help you finish it when the time comes. You don't understand. He's stronger than you can imagine. Nebula's face twists with uncertainty as she makes excuses. And we're stronger than you think we are. Peter says as he rests a comforting hand on her shoulder. This is your chance. You won't get another. Either take it or return to your father empty-handed. Nebula's instantly wavered, as a failure of this magnitude would mean another piece of her would be ripped away and replaced with cybernetics. Peter tinkered with the idea of revealing the Infinity Stones in his possession, as that would definitely bolster Nebula's faith in him. It certainly seemed to work in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, where Nebula joined forces with Ronan against her father after the Kree Warlord took possession of the Power Stone. Though Peter knew it was best to keep the stones a secret and would continue to do so, Nebula's hands tightened into clenched fists as her eyes went bloodshot and her heart beat like a racehorce. Fire. Chapter 159, C-159 Space Battle. Fire. Nebula made her decision and exclaimed through gritted teeth. Under Jarvis' control, instantly, every Kree warship, including the one they were currently in, launched countless weapons at the Chitori fleet. Thick red laser beams were the first to make contact with the enemy, as endless missiles soared through black space. Each ship had a few laser cannons attached to them, especially the flagship which had eight altogether. One red beam targeted each ship, while the remaining focused on the giant command ship. While everyone was watching and waiting for the missiles to hit their designated targets, Peter turned to see Nebula staring out of the window, observing the results of her command with bated breaths. Her eyes were slightly bloodshot, as she gripped her hands into tight fists, staring out of the window in silence. Boom. She watched as the first of many missiles hit its target, blowing a hole in one of the Chidori warships. Nebula's breathing sped up, as one after another, her father's ships were struck by the highly explosive Kree missiles. Never before has she rebelled against Thanos, the man that adopted her, though the idea was always in the back of her head. After every torturous cybernetic surgery, the thoughts of rebellion would grow stronger and stronger. Of course, one very crucial thing kept these thoughts at bay. Her father is one of the strongest beings in the known universe. How could she fight against someone that could kill her with a flick of his finger? Not to mention the fact that nobody would join her cause. Thanos' subordinates are known to be very loyal, as they're either true believers in his cause or know the consequences of such actions. Just as Peter was going to try and comfort her, Jarvis talks through the speakers of the ship. Incoming message from Chidori command ship. Translating. He says as he freezes for a moment before speaking again. Traitorous Kree scum? Thanos has been informed of your betrayal? There will be nowhere for you to hide, Ronan. Silence fills the ship as the message continues to badmouth both Ronan and the Kree race as a whole, though nobody here was a Kree, so the insults didn't really land as the Chidori expected. When the message finally ended, Peter spoke up. I guess, they know they're not surviving so they wanted to make their grievances known. Peter says with a shrug. Too bad Ronan isn't alive. I'm sure his reaction to that message would have been delightful. Nebula says spitefully. Before anyone else could say a word, the Chidori started their counterattack. Knowing that they wouldn't survive this encounter, the bug-like alien ships formed up in front of the command ship, protecting the brain of their army, at least for the time being. As their ships were exploding from the constant bombardment, the Chitori fleet fired up their engines and moved full speed toward the Ronin's former flagship. Ah, uh, Tony says worriedly. That doesn't look good. They're suicide bombing us. Charles comments with no small amount of fear. Eric, this would be your time to shine. Peter says as he turns to see a strained-looking Magneto glaring at the incoming ships. I'm already on it. Eric screams as he uses his magnetic powers to push the fleet of alien ships backward. Jarvis, can we maneuver away while Eric slows them down? Peter says, knowing that Eric was pushing his powers far past their limits at the moment. Yes, setting a new course. Jarvis replies and the ships start moving as they continue to fire at the slowed Chitori ships. Good. Peter says as he turns back to a sweating and tired looking Magneto. Eric, once we're out of the way, you can stop. Stop what? Nebula asks, wondering what was happening. He's holding them back by manipulating the metal of their ships. Peter explains curtly as he places a comforting hand on her shoulder. I told you before, we're stronger than you think. Huh, do you all have powers? She asks as those with abilities are rare, unless your race had some sort of innate ability. Though humans are relatively weak. Yup. Peter nods. And you're all from the same planet. She clarifies just to be sure. Borns and raised. Peter answers, shocking her even further. Can we do this whole introduction later? 
Steve yelled from the side in exasperation. Now's not really the best time for this. Magneto strained his powers to the max as Jarvis moved the ships, only bumping a single enemy ship as they dodged out of the way. As the Chidori ships passed by, missing their suicidal attack, they left their backs wide open for a counter. Jarvis, concentrate fire on their biggest ship. Peter orders, finding the perfect excuse to reveal a bit of his knowledge. Why? Tony asks before Jarvis could do anything. They used the smaller ships as a shield during their little offensive, so the giant command ship must be important somehow. Peter says with a shrug. He's right. Nebula backs up Peter's assessment. The command ship controls all of the Chidori and their ships. Destroy it and they will all shut down. Upon hearing this, every person on the ship turned to Nebula with an annoyed look on their faces. You knew this the entire time and didn't tell us. Fury asks with his usual suspicious look. I just betrayed my father, who happens to be the strongest person in the universe. Nebula fires back in a sharp sarcastic tone. I'm sorry that it slipped my mind. Fury merely clicked his tongue and turned his attention back to the Chidori fleet. Concentrating fire on the enemy command ship. Jarvis calls over the speakers. Immediately, every beam and missile fired from the Kree fleet changed trajectory. Each of them headed straight toward the back of the largest Chidori ship. The Chidori seemed to notice this, as they tried to maneuver their ships to form the shield once again, but sadly, it was too late for them. First to hit were the laser beams, which purposefully aimed at the engines and thrusters behind the command ship, forcibly stopping the ship in its tracks. As the ship was stranded in space, the missiles rained down onto key positions, blowing piece after piece of the ship's hull off into space. Soon enough, the thick red laser, which was tearing through the command ship, seemed to find a weak spot in the engine. Boom! In an instant, the back half of the enemy ship exploded in a bright purple light. Debris flew everywhere as the remaining missiles hit the destroyed ship, decimating the front half next. Suddenly, every Chidori ship shut down as Nebula said it would, drifting in space without a command to follow from their hive mind. As far as first space battles go, I'd call that a resounding success. Tony exclaims as he stared at the surviving Chidori ships greedily. Of course, the debris from the destroyed ships would come in handy too, though a complete ship was easier to study. Okay, Eric can you handle the scraps? Peter turns and asks. I think he'll need a minute. Charles says as Peter caught sight of Magneto, who was collapsed on the floor, breathing heavily. His nose and ears showed signs of bleeding, which certainly showed how hard Eric was pushing himself. Just give me a minute. Eric says with a huff as he wiped the blood from his nose. Actually, maybe an hour would be best. Looking at the floating debris, which was falling down to the planet, Peter wasn't sure what to do. I could open a portal to collect some, but I would only be able to get a small amount. Thinking for a moment, Peter gave up as he watched a small fraction of the Chidori ship scraps disappear into Earth's atmosphere. Is this the universe's way of making sure the vulture is born? Peter thought as he remembered his classmate's father. Whatever, I'll just keep an eye on her family. Maybe I can offer her father a job. After all, using alien scrap to invent villain-level technology is pretty impressive. Though, what worried him the most was the people he didn't know, who would also come into contact with the Chidori debris. Will there be some new villains and heroes because of this? Chapter 160, C-160 Metal Rain After the destruction of the Chidori fleet, Peter waited in the flagship alongside Tony, Magneto, and Nebula, who didn't know what to do with herself after betraying her father. Only an hour ago, her life revolved around doing her daddy's bidding, but now that's all gone. On top of that, there's this small feeling of dread for Thanos' reaction towards her choice. A little over an hour after the battle, Eric was well rested once again and started gathering the scraps of the Chidori ship. With Jarvis' help, he was able to load up all of the scraps into the cargo bays of each Kree ship. As for the five remaining ships, which were slightly damaged from the battle, Peter and Tony took a portal over to check them over. Based on how odd they looked from the outside, they were both sure that the controls would most likely be far more confusing than the Kree ships. Starting with the least damaged ship, Peter opened a portal and tested for oxygen, which the ship thankfully still had. Thank God. Peter mutters as he steps through followed by Tony, who was still armed in his Iron Man suit. Out of all of the remaining ships, I bet this is the only one with air. Tony says as the others had more major hull damage to account for. Well, we'll see. Peter says as they traverse the ship. Within minutes, the two found countless toppled over bodies of the surviving Chidori soldiers. Insert picture of Chidori here. Each of them was still alive and breathing, though they seemed to be in some sort of coma. Is it like a hive mind? Tony guesses as he looks over the ugly aliens. Yeah, I think they became brain dead after we destroyed that command ship. Peter says as he taps one with his foot. Do you think they could wake up if another command ship comes in range? Hmm, maybe. Tony didn't know for sure. Should we kill them then? Peter asks, getting an odd look from Tony. You know, in case another command ship comes, they could cause quite a bit of trouble. Not to mention the fact that our detainment floor is already packed with smurfs. Besides, these guys are creepy. Looking down at the monstrous looking aliens, Tony couldn't help but agree. They do remind me of a horror movie monster, though we should keep a certain amount alive for testing. Who knows, we might be able to find a weakness that can be exploited on our next encounter. Sounds good to me. Peter agreed as they continued exploring the ship. Soon enough, they found something that shocked Tony and reminded Peter of the attack on New York from the movie. 
In some sort of onboard hangar, ten colossal fish slash bug looking behemoths laid on the floor, like dead fish out of water. Although they seemed to be living beings, which were the size of large skyscrapers, they looked to be weaponized so that they can house hundreds of Chidori soldiers and their skiffs, Chidori Leviathans, also known as Chidori Dragons. The Leviathans are a race of biomechanically engineered Akanti Starshark hybrids produced by the Chidori to act as sort of large scale flying mount. What the hell are these? Tony says excitedly as he runs around the Leviathans like a kid in a candy store. Looks like some sort of weaponized space whale or something. Peter says, actually not knowing much about them, other than the fact that they destroyed a lot of buildings in the movie. I don't even know where I would begin with these things. Tony says as he wants to dissect one of them, but doing so would be extremely difficult due to their size. Let's figure that out when we're back on Earth. Peter says as they continue their search and finally find what appeared to be the control room. This is far worse than the Kree ships. Tony mutters in confusion. There were no screens, buttons, or obvious controls of any kind. Everything was far more, alien. Well, let's get Nebula. She'll hopefully know how any of this works. In a suburban home, a balding middle-aged white man sat on his couch with a beer in hand and a recorded football game playing on the flat screen TV. Insert picture of Adrian Toomes, the vulture, here. As he was watching the game in silence, sipping his beer on occasion, a beautiful black woman walks over and hugs him from behind. It's getting late. Liz is already asleep. She says after planting a kiss on his cheek. I just want to finish the game and I'll head off to bed. Adrian replies as he doesn't take his eyes off the TV. Okay, but don't be too long. You have to be up for work in about seven hours. She says and receives a tired groan in return. Don't groan at me. I have work tomorrow too. Sorry, I just wish that I had more time to relax sometimes. He says with a sigh. Don't we all? His wife says as she kisses him on the cheek once again and leaves the room. F***ing jets. Adrian cursed as he switched off the TV. Couldn't score even if their worthless lives depended on it. Almost an hour after his wife left, Adrian's team of choice lost spectacularly, driving him into the worst mood possible. What made it even worse is the fact that he would have to wake up for work in six hours, leaving him little room to sleep as long as he'd prefer. She's always right, he thought, pertaining to his lovely wife. Just as he was about to head upstairs and call it a day, the night sky lit up through the back windows, drawing his attention. Walking over to the windows leading to the moderately sized backyard, Adrian saw a mesmerizing scene of what looked like a shining meteor shower. A cluster of what seemed to be hundreds of meteors fell from the sky, though they burned in an ominous purple light, which was an odd sight to see. Did I drink too much? He thought but quickly threw that idea away, as he only had a few normal-sized cans. Taking in the sight of countless shooting stars, Adrian was lost in thought as only minutes later the sound of loud banging filled the whole neighborhood. As car alarms and other sounds of destruction filled his ears, Adrian saw a couple of these meteors fall and impact his backyard. What the? He mutters as more meteors fall and impact his neighbor's houses. Instead of burning up in the atmosphere of the earth, as meteors usually do, whatever was falling from the sky was coming down completely intact and bringing destruction with it. As sounds resembling some extreme version of a hailstorm filled his surroundings, every house in the neighborhood, including his own, was damaged to different extents, depending on the owner's luck. By this point, Adrian's wife and daughter, Liz had woken up screaming and ran down the stairs. Dad. Liz yelled as she saw her father at the bottom of the stairs looking out of the window. Get away from the window. Acting quickly, she pulls her father from the window just in time for a long and sharp metal shard to shatter it and impale the wood floor where he once stood. Staring at the spear-like metal that could have killed him, Adrian turned to his daughter with a thankful look. How'd you know? Something similar happened to the window upstairs. She says. Enough talking. His wife yells and opens a nearby door. Everyone in the basement, now. After spending the night in the basement together, waiting out the odd catastrophe that was happening outside, Adrian's cell phone started ringing. Ah, uh, hello. He answers as his family listens in out of boredom. Is this Adrian Toomes with Best Salvage? A woman asks from the other side of the call. Bestman Salvage is a cleanup crew owned by Adrian that holds a contract to salvage any incidents occurring in New York City. Yeah, is this about last night? He answers, both happy and annoyed at the same time. Happy, as he would be making a lot of money off of this incident, which his business was in dire need of, and annoyed, as it would be a lot of work in the coming days based on what he saw last night. He hadn't even slept yet. Yes, the mayor is calling in every salvage crew to clean up last night's incident. Chapter 161, C-161 Mass Murder Leaving Tony to work his magic in the control room alongside Nebula, who actually didn't know much about the Chidori ships, Peter started clearing out the Chidori from the remaining ships. Around a hundred of them would be saved for testing, while the rest were thrown through a portal leading to the sun. If these were Kree soldiers, Peter wouldn't have done this, but these were Thanos' private army of weird bug things. Not only are they creepy, but they have definitely culled multiple planets in the name of the Mad Titan's cause. Knowing this, Peter felt little to no pity as he incinerated thousands of Chidori soldiers. Of course, the giant leviathans in the hangars were left alone, as Tony would be mad if he threw away his most interesting test subjects. Although some of the other Chidori ships were blown open and no longer habitable, Peter had a spell for that so his cleaning wasn't slowed very much. 
As for the ships themselves, Peter planned to leave them in orbit for the time being, until he and Tony could figure out how to get them down to Earth. I'll probably have to open a huge portal and drop them in the desert somewhere. Peter thought as he floated through a heavily damaged ship with a golden glow covering his body from head to toe. As Peter was doing this, Tony tore apart yet another control room with Nebula's assistance, though Peter wouldn't blame him this time around. The Cheetorai's technology was confusing after all. Even Thanos' daughter didn't know how to navigate the damn thing. Hours later, Peter finished his cleanup and returned to Tony, who didn't look to be anywhere near understanding the Chitori ship's controls. Any breakthroughs? Peter asks as he walks into a gutter control room. Nope, this one may take a few days. Tony says with a stumped look on his face. All right, I'm gonna head back to Earth and put the remaining Chitori in storage or something, Peter says as he walks off. I'll be back when I have time. Bring me food. Tony yells and receives a confirming wave in reply as Peter leaves the control room. After carrying the remaining Chitori through a portal and storing them in a locked room near Tony's workshop, not including the Leviathans, Peter returned home to let everyone know they can leave. After all, he told them to stay in the house until he tells them otherwise. Stepping through a portal to his living room, Peter found it completely empty and soon noticed the time. 6 a.m. They're probably asleep. Peter thought as he deactivated the house's defenses and went to his bedroom. On the bed, Ned's family slept in their forced slumber. MJ must be in one of the guest rooms. Peter mutters as he portals Ned's family back to their house and removes the spell that kept them asleep. Returning home before they woke up, Peter threw his sheets in the wash, as he felt weird about people other than him and MJ sleeping in his bed. You're back. May exclaims as she leaves her bedroom to find Peter in the hall. Yeah, both waves of aliens were taken care of. Peter says as May grabs him in a warm hug. Wait. She says as she pulls back. Both waves. Yeah, after the press conference, the second half of their army arrived, though they were pretty easy to handle. Peter says with a shrug. After talking to May for a bit, Peter learned about the shower of alien ship parts that fell to Earth from their battle. It didn't take long for everyone to figure out that the stuff falling from the sky was from the aliens you were fighting. May explains. Hmm, I'm probably going to have to confiscate all of that. Peter muttered. I would act quickly if I were you. May says as she sips her morning coffee. A bunch of companies have been joining the cleanup. They say it's out of the goodness of their hearts, but it's obvious that they just want to get as much alien tech as they can before anyone steps in. Seeing as he had a lot to do, Peter left the house before anyone else could wake up. First, he took a quick trip to in and out and dropped off some food to Tony and Nebula. What is this? Nebula asks as she stares warily at her first ever burger and fries. It's food, try it. Tony says as he starts tearing through his own burger. Copying Tony's way of eating, Nebula grabbed the burger with two hands and took a bite. Instantly, her eyes go wide as she looks down at the burger in shock. It's good, right? Peter says with a knowing smile. Without another word, Nebula started eating at a faster pace than Tony, devouring her food like a champion speed eater. After giving his workers some food, Peter returned to the Kree flagship. Jarvis, you here? Peter asks. Yes, sir. He replies in an instant. How can I be of service? I need you to broadcast my image to every TV on Earth, like what Ronan did. Is it possible after all of Tony's destruction? Peter asks. Yes, sir. Would you like to begin now? Jarvis confirms. No, find a secluded place to land the Kree fleet on Earth first. Peter says as Jarvis goes quiet for a moment. A desert region with open space would be preferential, Jarvis says as a map appears in front of Peter with many marked locations. Let's do the Mojave Desert for now. Peter just picked one at random. We can move them later if needed. Yes, sir. Should we move out now? Jarvis asks. Yeah, though, set a course for New York City. I want to show off a bit before we land. Peter says and every Cree ship forms up and descends into Earth's atmosphere. Course set? Jarvis informs. Good, when we're above New York, I want the ships to hover there. Then we can start the broadcast. Peter instructs. Yes, sir. New York City, alias investigations. As Jessica Jones clocked in for work, she found her new lackey sleeping on the floor behind her desk hugging an empty bottle of liquor as usual. Loki Odinson. Hey, wake up you lazy bum. Jessica says as he shakes him with her boot. Ah. Loki slowly wakes up and turns to see her standing over him. Go away, you pesky woman. You're sleeping in my office rent-free, not to mention all of the money you owe me. Jessica says as she kicks him this time. Bang. Before he knew what was coming, Loki was swept off of the floor and hit the nearby wall. We have work to do, so get dressed and meet me downstairs, or else. Leaving that small threat behind, Jessica grabbed a file from her desk and left the room. Sigh. Loki watched her leave as he uncorked his bottle, bringing it to his lips. Tilting the bottle upwards, not a single drop flowed into his mouth. F asterisk CK. Loki muttered as he tossed the empty bottle across the room. Crash. Every since Loki was banished to Midgard, he tried his best to do any kind of magic, but nothing seemed to work. Even the external magic, which required no magic of his own, seemed unresponsive to his call. Instantly, Loki knew that this was his father's doing. A sort of extra punishment on top of his banishment and a newfound mortal body. Without his magic, Loki started to descend into a downward spiral. He drank like the worst kind of alcoholic and lived like a bum. 
The only thing keeping him in one place was the odd mortal woman, who was far stronger than any Midgardian should be. He told himself that he was staying to repay his debt, but Loki could slip away from her watchful gaze at any moment. Even without magic, he is a very capable man after all. The real reason he stays at the beck and call of a mortal woman is fairly simple, though he would never admit it to himself. Cleaning himself up in the small bathroom in the office, Loki meets Jessica outside on the sidewalk. As he stepped outside, Loki noticed an odd shade blocking the sun. Meanwhile, Jessica and everyone else craned their necks upwards and stared at the sky. Following their gaze, Loki found 20 Kree warships floating above the city. What are the Kree doing here? Chapter 162, C-162 showing off. What are the Kree doing here? Loki wondered, as he has been in a drunken stupor during the whole alien invasion scare. Soon enough, everyone in the street took out their phones and started taking pictures and recording the huge spaceships. Pacing over to Jessica, Loki grabbed her by the arm and pulled her toward the door. What? She asks, not budging a single inch. Get inside. Loki says as he points to the door. Even with your strength, you can't fight an entire Kree army. Loki didn't fully understand why he cared so much about her well-being, but he would do his best to keep her safe, even without his powers. What do you mean? Jessica laughed at his behavior. The fight already ended. The Avengers won. I'm pretty sure this is them bringing the ships back. How do you not know this? What? Loki asks in confusion. Across the street, a store with TVs in its window all changed at the same time. The image of Spider-Man appeared with a similar setting as Ronan behind him showing. Except this time it was the New York City skyline. Loki frowned in annoyance as soon as he saw Peter appear on the TV. Insufferable mortal. Hello, everyone. It's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man here. Peter says with a wave. As you can see, I've brought the remaining Kree ships to Earth as I said I would. They're now Avengers property. Cool, right. Loki couldn't help but roll his eyes as he followed Jessica and everyone else in the vicinity across the street to get a better look. I thought that I would update you on some recent happenings and make an announcement while I'm at it. Peter says as he leans against the window behind him. First, after my last press conference, another army of aliens called the Chidori arrived and were swiftly dealt with by our new ship's firepower. They were apparently allied with the Kree, who we took these nice ships from. Peter pats the metal wall beside him as he mentions the Kree ships. Some of you may have put two and two together upon hearing that. Yes, the stuff that fell from the sky recently was the scrap of the destroyed Chidori ships, which leads me to the announcement that I was talking about. Peter says as he starts to get a bit more serious, I'm afraid that we'll have to confiscate all alien scraps and tech that have fallen to Earth. It's far too dangerous to be left in humanity's idle hands. Instantly, those that had something to gain from the alien scraps went into an uproar. Whether it was CEOs, governments, or the grunts that collected everything for a price, they were all angered. Alien tech. Loki thought with an interested smirk. Drinking his morning coffee, Adrian Toomes was watching TV before it was time to head out to work, though his morning was ruined by the announcement made by Spider-Man. He stared at the TV in a daze for a moment before rage filled his mind. After all, this cleanup job was a godsend for his failing business. Without it, his business will go right back down the drain. Now, I know many people wouldn't like this, so I'll give you all a bit of an incentive. Spider-Man says, drawing Adrian's attention right back to the TV. Anyone who delivers Chidori ship scraps to Avengers Tower will be paid $1,000 per pound, though, on the other hand, anyone caught harboring any of these scraps will be heavily punished. This is a message to everyone, governments, companies, organizations, and citizens alike. Holy sh asterisk t. Adrian exclaimed as his grip loosened and his coffee mug fell to the floor. Shatter. $1,000 a pound is more than 500 times the price of normal scrap metal. Adrian calculated in shock. Dad, are you okay? Liz comes running into the kitchen worriedly. Yay, I have to get to work. Adrian exclaims as he grabs his car keys and rushes out of the door. If he wasn't quick, someone else would take all of the scraps. After all, everyone would be on the hunt for the tiniest amount of alien just to make a quick buck. Liz stood in confusion as her father ran off. Also, any civilians that suffered property damage from the falling scraps can submit proof to Avengers Tower and we'll compensate you for your loses, Peter says and pauses to think for a moment. I haven't heard of any deaths, but if a family member was killed or you were injured, contact us and we'll be happy to help. Although he didn't feel responsible, as they stopped an entire invasion from causing way more damage and deaths, Peter still didn't mind lending a hand. He felt a little bad for letting the aftermath of their battle affect the people of Earth, so Peter would use Tony's money to help them out. I'm such a kind man. Peter thought as he wiped an imaginary tear from his cheek. Anyway, this concludes your annual alien invasion update. Happy scrap hunting everyone. Peter says with a wave as Jarvis ends the broadcast, returning everyone's TVs back to normal. All right, let's go park these bad boys. Yes, sir. Jarvis replies as the fleet above New York City shoots off toward the west. Only minutes after they flew away from New York, Peter's phone started ringing. Yo. Peter answers. You just had to show off, didn't you? Fury's annoyed voice says from the other end. Well, I have a fleet of alien warships. How can I not parade them around a little? Peter asks with a smirk. Sigh, your stance on the scraps is going to make us a lot of enemies. Fury changes the subject. I can already tell you that the World Security Council isn't happy. I'm sure they aren't. 
Peter says with a laugh. They lost their power cube thing and now they're risking the wrath of the strongest group of people in the world by harboring scraps. This isn't a laughing matter. Fury says with a disgruntled tone. You're right, but that doesn't change the facts. Besides, who's going to do anything about it? We have a fleet of advanced alien warships and a congregation of Earth's mightiest heroes. I doubt they'll risk anything over some scraps. Especially after we just saved the planet from two separate alien invasions. I disagree. Fury says resolutely. How so? Peter asks. I've noticed a lot of off-the-books missions lately. Missions that I haven't signed off on. Fury reveals. So, S.H.I.E.L.D. is up to something, huh? Peter says as he instantly thought of Hydra. Speaking of your leaky ship, have you found any leads to the cancer that has infected your ranks? Why is it that whenever we talk about S.H.I.E.L.D., it feels like you know something that I don't? Fury asks with a no-nonsense tone. It's because I do. Peter says as he hangs up the phone. That should annoy the hell out of him. During what little free time he has, Peter has collected a small amount of evidence on the high-level members of Hydra that have infected S.H.I.E.L.D. It wasn't much, as they didn't have much of a trail to follow. The ghost laptop may be overpowered when it comes to hacking, but if there's nothing to find, then it doesn't matter. Though it was enough to show their off-the-books actions, which were either done to hurt S.H.I.E.L.D. or help those in Hydra. I should probably deal with S.H.I.E.L.D. before they become a problem. Peter thought, which is why he started dropping hints to Fury once again. Then we can absorb the remaining S.H.I.E.L.D. agents into the Avengers. While Peter was planning the early downfall of Hydra, Jarvis landed the 20 warships in a clearing in the Mojave Desert. I should probably hide them. Peter said as he cast a wide-range invisibility enchantment on the whole area. Immediately, the scene of giant towering spaceships was replaced with empty desert land. That should do for now, Peter thought. An enchantment of this level wouldn't fool any master of the mystic arts, but it would do perfectly fine against everyone else which is all he needed at the moment. Before leaving to the Avengers Tower, where he would have to manage the mass amounts of incoming scrappers, Peter gave Jarvis an order. Jarvis, compile all useful information from the Kree databanks and move it over to the tower, but make sure that only council members can access it. Yes, sir. This victory over Thanos' army is the Earth's first real encounter with aliens, so Peter was hoping to get some information for the next encounter. Planets, peoples, empires, technology, etc. Especially information that wasn't shown in the movies, as that's an area that Peter lacks in immensely. Chapter 163, C-163 Meeting a Titan as Peter was about to leave the flagship to deal with some money-grubbing scrappers, he was stopped by a beeping sound that suddenly went off in the control room. Sir, we have an incoming call. Jarvis informs, causing Peter to freeze for a moment as his eyebrow arches upwards. Answer it. Peter replies and looks toward the screen on the wall. But record our conversation just in case. Yes, sir. Jarvis says as a familiar voice fills the room. I knew you were incompetent, though I didn't know you were a traitor, Ronan. A seated Thanos appears on screen with distant stars at his back. I'm afraid Ronan can't come to the phone right now, Peter says as he internally freaks out about meeting the real Thanos. Can I take a message? Who are you? Thanos asks as he looks down at Peter, who is garbed in his usual spider attire. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, Peter says as if Thanos would understand that. May I ask who's calling? I can forward your message to Ronan, but it may take a while for him to receive it. Are you playing with me, boy? Thanos tilts his head and glares at Peter through the screen. Yes. Peter nods and gives the purple giant a thumbs up. Ronan is dead, isn't he? Thanos states and doesn't wait long enough for Peter to confirm before cursing the dead. What a waste of resources. Yeah, he left behind this cool hammer though, and for that I am thankful. Peter says as he pulls the cosmic rod from his back and spins it between his fingers. Anyway, are you the mastermind or something? If that's the case, I'd like to thank you for the ships. Earth is behind when it comes to space travel, so your contribution to my growing space fleet is appreciated. I see, every word that comes from your mouth is tailored to anger me. Thanos says as he leans forward in his chair. It isn't smart to anger me, boy. Eh, worst case scenario, you send another army. Peter shrugs as if he didn't care at all. I could always use more ships for my growing fleet. Unless, of course, you come here yourself. I'm a bit busy at the moment, though I could give you an infinite amount of ships, for a price. Thanos offers as he leans back in his chair. Nah, I don't have that tesseract thingy Ronan was after. Peter refuses instantly. You know, I've heard a bit about you from your daughter, Nebula. What has my most pitiful daughter been saying? Thanos asks with a small chuckle. Oh, just how all-powerful you are and all that. Peter explains as if he didn't believe her. You should take her advice. Thanos says threateningly. Eh, I think she's just scared of her abusive daddy. Peter waves off the thinly veiled threat. Abusive. Thanos laughed. Yeah, but I'm not child protective services, so I don't really care. Peter shrugs as he looks into Thanos' eyes. You'll be dead soon enough anyway. He he ha 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 ha. Peter's statement seemed to tickle the mad titan's funny bone. You think you are capable of killing me? Boy, I've eradicated entire planets filled with beings stronger than you. That reminds me of Ronan's last words, though we'll find out soon enough, won't we? Peter smirks under his mask. Just do me a favor and send a stronger grunt next time. Ronan was just too easy to kill. You are either insane or ignorant beyond measure. Thanos shakes his head with an entertained smile on his face. 
Before Peter could give a snarky reply, Thanos' image disappeared, as he cut the call from his end. Was it necessary to taunt an unknown enemy? Jarvis asks as the call ended. Definitely. Peter replies with a chuckle. Peter's bread and butter as Spider-Man is annoying the hell out of his enemies before smacking them into submission, but there was an underlying reason behind poking the bear in this situation. After searching every ship, Peter found no signs of the Mind Stone, which was originally supposed to be here during the invasion of New York. Peter hoped that angering his enemy will cause Thanos to bring out the big guns. Either he comes to Earth with the Mind Stone, or he sends a grunt along with it. It was a dangerous gamble, as Peter was calling over one of the strongest beings in the universe to play, but at the end of the day, this isn't Thanos with a full Infinity Gauntlet. He only has the Mind Stone, which is definitely dangerous, but certainly not unbeatable. After all, Earth has possession of three Infinity Stones and will have another when the Dark Elves make their appearance. Though Peter didn't plan on using any of them until he has a medium to control their overwhelming power. Not to mention the fact that Odin is still alive, which looked to be the reason Thanos refuses to come himself. Peter thought that was plausible. He literally waited until after Ragnarok to attack Earth in the movies, so it makes sense. Midgard technically falls under Odin's territory, and the Alphather is most likely capable of fighting Thanos on his own. Though he is getting weaker in his old age, so Odin may be at a disadvantage these days. At the end of the day, Peter had multiple reasons why he felt it was okay to mess with Thanos, though his actions could come to backfire on him. Only time will tell. Don't forget to compile that info. Peter reminded Jarvis as he opened a portal and stepped through. One week later. After a week of utter chaos, Peter spent hundreds of millions of Tony's billions and collected the vast majority of Chidori scraps. Jarvis, start hacking into the companies and organizations that got involved in the cleanup. I want to know whether they actually gave me everything or not. Peter orders as he sits back on Tony's couch and sipped a warm tea through his mask. Yes, sir. Jarvis replies affirmatively. I'll alert you when anything of interest is found. Every organization came to the tower and handed over their scraps, though some would think themselves smart and stash away the good stuff. It's human nature. Peter thought without a doubt. We're all greedy after all. Currently, the storage floors under the tower are packed with Chidori ship debris, which Peter is planning to move to the Kree and Chidori ships in the Mojave Desert. Tony was able to fly down two of the Chidori ships, while the other three were portaled over by Peter, as they were inoperable. Due to the congregation of warships in the Mojave Desert, Tony has a perimeter being built alongside some facilities, so they could work on their new fleet. At this point, two of the Kree ships have been outfitted with understandable controls, which makes it possible for them to fly if needed, though they could always just have Jarvis do all of the work. Sort of like a perfect autopilot. As for his conversation with Thanos, every council member saw the recording and most weren't happy with Peter's taunting. Well, Tony gave me a thumbs up and Eric smirked, while everyone else wasn't so supportive. Peter laughed internally, though they got over it fairly quickly. After all, Thanos would have attacked again either way. He wanted the space stone and nothing would stop him in his quest for balance. There is one good thing that came of them seeing the recording though. The whole council was suddenly very interested in the progress of the super soldier serum. Dealing with an alien invasion as well as threats of another on the horizon seemed to spark the need for more manpower. After all, if they had a small army of super soldiers, then dealing with their newfound enemy and his armies would be far easier. Not to mention the other empires and alien organizations out there that could come knocking at any moment. Thanks to Jarvis cataloging the entirety of the Kree databanks, they all knew a lot more about the infinite universe than before. I thought the Earth had problems. Fury commented as he read about all of the different empires and their wars over the years. There's more human-like races than I thought there would be. Tony said as he went over the information. Yeah, most aliens seem to be humanoid but add in a random characteristic. Like blue skin or some sort of accenting feature. Peter nodded as he came to the same conclusion. We could reach out to one of the more respectable empires and ally ourselves with them. Charles offers an idea. I doubt any empire would want to ally with us, as they would be making an enemy out of Thanos, but we can try. Chapter 164, C-164 Chuck E. Cheese. Our best option is probably the Nova Empire. Peter says after a moment of thought. Technically we're already allied with Asgard, but an extra ally shouldn't cause any trouble. The Nova Empire is an interstellar hegemony made up of multiple alien species that maintains a strict but benevolently personified rule over a good portion of the galaxy. While the Empire is made up of various alien races, it is ruled primarily by the Xandarians, who are externally indistinguishable from humans, except for the fact of sometimes have different eye colors and other minute differences. Other races known to inhabit the government are the Krolorians, the Aachans, the Herctarians, and countless others. Based on the data Jarvis compiled, Ronan was a huge enemy of theirs, so we should already have some goodwill with them. Peter explains to the rest of the Avengers Council. I'm sure they'll be happy to accept the gift of Ronan's remaining soldiers. Despite the recent treaty between the Kree and Nova empires, Ronan the Accuser was disgusted by the treaty which signaled an end to the Kree-Nova war, so he continued massacring Xandarian outposts across the galaxy, slaughtering children and families in the process. The logs of these escapades were carefully stored in the databanks. We could also gift them Ronan's body, though they could possibly find that offensive. Magneto offers his thoughts. The Nova Empire would find such an offering distasteful, though they would still need the body for proof of death. 
Jarvis informs them as he has access to all of their information. All right, we can seal his remains in a coffin and hand it over during our first meeting. Fury was in agreement as well. Good, Jarvis can you use the Kree ships to contact the Nova Corps and schedule a meeting with Nova Prime. The Nova Corps is the intergalactic military and police force of the Nova Empire, led by an individual holding the rank of Nova Prime. If I recall correctly, the current Nova Prime is a woman, though I don't remember her name. Peter thought as he remembered her from the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Would you like me to schedule the meeting here or on Xander? Jarvis asks. Whichever is more convenient for them. Peter replies, as he could portal back and forth easily. Also, be upfront about Ronan's involvement with Thanos. If they're going to be our allies, then transparency is important. Should we be so open this early on? Fury asks as he's used to playing spy games. It's likely that they'll refuse if we tell them. Then they weren't worth being our allies, to begin with. Peter says with a shake of his head. With the council in full agreement on who to ally themselves with, Peter and Tony split their time between outfitting their new fleet of warships and finishing up the super soldier serum. Jarvis would notify them when he had a time and place for their meeting with the Nova Empire. That is, if they don't get scared off upon hearing the Mad Titan's name. As for the super soldier serum, it was pretty much finished by this point. The only thing holding them back from calling it a finished product was the fact that they weren't sure how the newer version of the serum would react to Vita radiation. Vita radiation is electromagnetic radiation with a specific wavelength that has stabilizing properties. It was used to activate the properties of the super soldier serum in Steve Rogers and would be needed in the new serum as well. The only way to find out is through testing. Peter thought as he and Tony started building a miniature test chamber for rats. Either we're going to have some buff rats running around, or it's back to the drawing board. Tony jokes as they lock a rat into a miniature chamber, similar to the one shown in the Captain America movie. Good luck, Chucky. Peter wishes him luck as the chamber locks shut. Turning to the side, Peter saw Tony insert a vial of blue super soldier serum into a line that leads to the chamber with the rat. Behind him against the wall is a huge old style network of machines, which are used to pump the Vita rays into the chamber. Are you sure that your dad's old equipment still works? Peter asks as he looks over the ancient machinery. Yup, I tested it yesterday when you went home to spend your night with Fury's daughter. Tony says with a teasing smirk. Don't be so loud. Peter yelled as they were in the tower at the moment, and anyone could hear. Oh, relax. Tony chuckles as he rolls his eyes. The workshop is soundproof and locked to anyone that isn't me, you, and Pepper. Speaking of Pepper Dash Peter turns the tables back onto Tony. No. Tony groans as he knew he fell into a trap. What? Peter asks with a smirk. You can't just avoid the subject. Either you convince her that you won't cheat on her and start dating, or you stay alone for the rest of your life. Because my aunt is off limits. I'll kill you before I let her even leave the house with you. Well, we don't necessarily have to leave the house. Tony says as his perverted smirk returns. Peter doesn't grace him with a response and just glares in silence. Okay, relax. I'll stay away from your mommy. Tony laughs awkwardly as he turns away from Peter's intense glare. Good. Peter nods though she wasn't his mother, he wouldn't say anything as he got what he wanted. Now let's talk about the real problem. What? Tony asks as he had a bad feeling. You're obvious cowardice. Peter says as Tony looks at him like he was mentally impaired. I just fought ships full of alien soldiers with you. I'd say that disqualifies me from being a coward. Tony corrects him. Really? Peter asks as he crosses his arms and stares unconvinced. Then how come you haven't asked Pepper out yet? What are you talking about? That's all I've been doing. Tony's tone started to get heated. No, you flirt and try to seduce her, but she always turns you down, and then you pretend it was all a joke. Peter explains the cycle that he has seen countless times. The only way you'll ever get a real answer is if you seriously ask her out. No games or jokes. Just invite her on a date and make it clear that you want to be monogamous. She won't believe me. Tony says with a sigh, knowing his lecherous past has tainted her belief in him. Well, find a way to make her. Peter says with a shrug. You're a smart guy. I'm sure that you can figure it out. You know her best after all. Tony stayed silent for a moment before they heard the sound of scratching on metal. Looking down, they could hear the rat in the chamber scratching at the door, trying its best to escape but failing miserably. Let's just focus on the experiment. Tony says with a relieved sigh. I can fix my love life later. Sure. Peter says as they get to work. Within minutes they begin the first experiment, hoping everything would go well. With the flick of a switch, a tiny amount of blue-colored super soldier serum shoots through small pipes, which lead to needles that eject from the chamber and stab into the frightened rat. High-pitch painful squeaks rang out from the mini-chamber, drawing both Peter's and Tony's attention. Hit him with 5% Vita radiation. Peter calls out. On it. Tony says and flips a switch, activating his father's old machinery. With the twist of a dial, a bright light began to appear from the closed chamber window as the painful squeaks grew louder and more frequent. Bump it up to 10% dot. Peter says as Tony shrugs and twists the dial up to 10%. Soon enough the sounds from the rat completely died down, meaning that the experiment was probably over. When Steve went through this procedure, they had to boost the Vita rays up to 100%, but this was a small rat so 10% should be more than enough. Shut it down. Peter says and with another flick of a switch the machinery shut down. As the light died down, Peter opened up the small chamber, releasing some steam and revealing a much bigger rat. 
Damn, Chucky. Peter says as he sees the packed muscle on the rat that seemed to grow twice in size. You're ripped. Just as Peter was staring in shock at the muscle-bound rat, it jumped out of the chamber, denting the metal with its feet, as it landed on Peter and bit him on the arm. Ah, mother fasterisker. Chapter 165, C-165 Tony's Big Day. After tearing the rat from his arm, Peter and Tony built a big and strong enough cage to hold the thing. Although it was now basically a super rat, it would still live out its days as a pet in Tony's workshop, as releasing it was dangerous, and killing it was a bit of a cruel end for Chucky. Once Chucky was secured, Tony and Peter basked in their achievement. We did it. Tony exhaled a sigh as he flopped down into his computer chair. Yeah, all that's left is some minor tests and then we can start implementing the serum. Peter says, causing Tony to tiredly pull himself back up to his feet. Let's get to dash Tony starts but was quickly interrupted by Jarvis. Sir, I've made contact with the Nova Corps. Jarvis informs them. What did they say? Peter asks curiously. Nova Prime Irani Rail has invited you to attend a meeting on Xander. Jarvis explains. That was her name. Peter recalled as he heard Jarvis. How long would it take to fly to Xander? Tony asks, excited about traveling to a populated alien planet this time around. Morig was fun for a while but after he witnessed the barren rocky land and smelly polluted ocean water once, he felt as though he'd seen it a million times over. The excitement of an actual alien planet filled with countless mysterious life forms and architecture seemed far more tantalizing. At full speed in a Cree ship. One week, sir. Jarvis answers after doing some quick calculations. That's a waste of a week. Tony muttered as they needed to start administering the super soldier serum. I think you're forgetting that I can portal us there in an instant. Peter says as Tony's mood brightens in an instant. All that Peter will need is the spatial coordinates from Jarvis, who practically has a universal GPS now, thanks to his access to the Cree ships and their databanks. Perfect. Tony exclaims as he gestures to the super rat in its reinforced cage. That gives us more than enough time to finish and roll out the new serum. Sounds good to me. Peter says as he turns his attention to Jarvis. Inform the Nova Corps that we'll arrive in a week's time. Yes, sir. After a couple of days of rat testing, alongside a few other test runs, which produced some more super-powered animals, Peter was certain that the serum was working without any flaws. Going over the blood tests of a monkey that was just turned into a super soldier, Peter and Tony relaxed as they ate big juicy-looking steaks. I feel bad for eating cowabunga like this, but the serum made his meat so delicious. Peter says as he reluctantly takes another bite. As soon as the meat touched his tongue, Peter's eyes closed and he moaned in delight. Ah, I've come to terms with eating meat a long time ago. Tony says as he unabashedly shoves a big piece into his mouth. After Peter finished his guilty yet pleasurable meal, the testing was complete. Every animal they administered the serum to was a complete success. Not a single one of them had a bad reaction or symptoms that pointed to anything being wrong, nor did any tests they ran afterward show any problems. Who's first? Tony asked as they stared at the human-sized chamber in front of them. Everything was in place. The chamber was open, multiple vials of blue super soldier serums were plugged in place, and the old-school Vita Ray machines were powered and ready to go. I can go first if you're nervous. Peter offered, trying to be nice. Though Tony's ego didn't see it that way. Who's nervous? He scoffs as he internally hyped himself up, while doing his best to forget the screams of every animal test subject that went through what he was about to go through. I'll go first. You sure? Peter asks as he could read Tony like a book. Tony doesn't bother replying as he strips down to his underwear and enters the chamber. Instantly, metal bindings shoot out from the chamber and trap him in place, so he doesn't thrash around and screw up the procedure. This happened to one of the animal test subjects, resulting in only a portion of its body acclimating to the serum. That wasn't a pretty sight to behold. Peter cringed at the memory. Let's get this show on the road. Tony calls out, wanting to get this over with. You got it. Peter shrugs and presses a large button. Suddenly, the chamber slowly closed, locking the nervous Tony Stark inside. I don't think I've ever been more excited and scared at the same time before. Tony thought as Peter walked up to the small window of the chamber and tapped on it. You okay in there? He asks as he peers inside and sees a smirk on his best friend's face. Yup, hit me with it. Tony exclaims. All right. Peter nods as he walks over to the control panel and flips a switch. Instantly, the vials filled with blue serum begin to empty, flowing into the chamber in unison. Ow. Tony shouts in pain as multiple needs eject and stick into his flesh, injecting him with every last drop of blue liquid. Good luck. Peter calls out as he activated the Vita radiation and slowly ramps the percentage from zero all the way up to 100%. Ah. Tony screamed in agony as his body went through a complete transformation. They went to 100% in the movie, so I should probably do the same. Peter thought as he kept slowly turning the dial higher and higher. F asterisk CKU. Tony started cursing anything that came to his mind, doing his best to cope with the agonizing pain. Ayah. You wanted to go first. Peter muttered as he didn't envy Tony's current position. Next time don't act brave. I heard that. Tony yelled and went right back to screaming like a Dragon Ball Z character. Hmm, his enhanced hearing must be kicking in. Peter thought as the dial hit 100% and the screams stopped. Silence filled the room as Peter waited only a moment before shutting down the Vita radiation with a flick of a switch. 
As the dial lost its momentum and fell back down to zero, Peter pressed a button that activated the chamber doors. White vapor-like smoke spilled out of the chamber as it opened, clouding Tony's image behind a fog. You alive? Peter asks as the smoke clears, revealing the new and improved Tony Stark. Holy sh asterisk t. Tony mutters as he breathes heavily. Standing in the chamber covered in sweat, a taller and far more muscular Tony Stark looked exhausted beyond belief. Damn, I didn't think I'd ever see your lazy a s with abs. Peter jokes. Tony may have been a healthy man before this, but he was far too lazy to train his body to a certain extent and tended to rely on his Iron Man armor, so this new body was a godsend to him. All the results with none of the work ethic to get there. Truly every person dreams. Peter thought with a laugh. As the chamber doors fully opened, before he could reply to Peter's words, the metal straps holding Tony up retracted. Instantly, Tony fell over and smacked into the cold hard floor. Peter was positioned to stop his fall, but he took a step back and got out of the way just in time. You could have caught me. Tony glares as he shakily picks himself up. You, no, you're naked and sweaty. Peter says with a shake of his head. Besides, you're a super soldier now. Tripping onto the floor won't even put a scratch on your new body. If anything, you'll hurt the floor. True to Peter's words, the floor was cracked slightly from Tony's fall. Tony merely rolls his eyes as he stood and noticed his height difference almost immediately. Normally, Tony and Peter were both the same height of six feet, though that's no longer the case. Tony now stands around two or three inches above Peter, which technically isn't much of a growth spurt compared to Steve's transformation. Though Steve was practically a midget before his procedure. Before either of them could comment on this, Tony saw his reflection in a nearby mirror and rushed over to get a better look. You done? Peter asks as he waited almost five minutes for Tony to tear his eyes away from his own reflection. No. Tony keeps his eyes on the mirror and flexes his newfound muscles. Is it wrong that I find myself extremely attractive? Yes, you're probably G asterisk Y. Peter says teasingly. Maybe that's why Pepper keeps turning you down. She must have seen something that we didn't. Huh. Tony jumps and turns away from the mirror to see Peter's teasing smirk. Oh, shut up. You're just jealous that I'm hot now, right? Peter says sarcastically. Before Tony could put his clothes back on, the door of the workshop swung open, and only three people could open them without restriction. Two of them were already inside. Tony, have you finished the... Pepper struts in and freezes in shock as she caught sight of Tony's chiseled body. I told you, I'm hot. Tony smirks over his shoulder at Peter as he stands proudly for Pepper to ogle him. Chapter 166, C-166 Rise After ogling Tony for a good while, Pepper didn't know what to do or how to explain her heated gaze, so she rushed out of the workshop with a heavy blush coating her entire face. Tony laughed like a madman as she dashed away, resembling an embarrassed lovestruck schoolgirl. How will you break it to her? Peter asks with a fake sorrowful tone. Break what? Tony asks in confusion. That you're gay. Peter says with a smirk. Since Tony is the first ever human to be given their version of the super soldier serum, they spent the rest of the day testing him for any unforeseen problems, though none reared their ugly head, thankfully. As soon as they found nothing wrong with Tony, Peter called over every member of the Avengers Council for their own procedure. I'll go last, I guess. Peter thought as he didn't really mind. Only half an hour passed since they called the meeting, yet every council member ran over as fast as they could. Well, except Charles who technically rolled over. Usually, when anyone calls a meeting, it takes at least a couple of hours for everyone to arrive, but it seems that they were excited to become super soldiers. Even Fury, who is a fairly busy man, was the second to arrive behind Eric, though Magneto lives in the tower. It would be hard to beat someone that only has to take the elevator to attend a meeting. All right, I'm sure you've probably guessed why we called you here. Peter says as they all were observing the equipment and vials of blue liquid around the room. Did you finish it? Magneto asks, though before Peter could answer, Tony strolls in with a soda in hand. Instantly, everyone besides Peter was shocked, as Tony was walking around without a shirt on, showing off his newly gained physique. That answers the question, doesn't it? Fury rolls his singular eye as he watches Tony strut around like a narcissistic peacock. So, notice anything different about me? Tony asks as he spreads his arms and spins in a circle. Did you get a new haircut? Charles feigns ignorance with a smile. Meanwhile, everyone else stayed quiet, unwilling to stroke Tony's already large ego. Tony's smirk disappears as he looks at his fellow council members in annoyance. You guys are no fun. Hee hee, forget about all of that. Who wants to become a super soldier first? Peter says as everyone in the room turns their gaze to Charles. As the only handicapped person in the room, Charles had so much to gain from taking the super soldier serum. Not only will he gain all of Steve Rogers' powers, but he should have a good chance at walking again. Though Peter wasn't 100% sure whether that was possible or not. He may just end up as a really strong guy in a wheelchair. Peter thought of the worst case scenario. After all, the serum is only known to strengthen and grow the body. They didn't run any tests on injured animals, so it was a mystery whether the serum would heal the professor or not. If it doesn't heal him, then the resurrection elixir should do the trick. Peter thought, though Charles would have to wait a while, as Peter hasn't even started looking for more dragon bones. I think there's some in the city. Peter thought. 
he could remember clearly from the Defenders show, that the hand was digging somewhere in Hell's Kitchen, as parts of New York were built over a dragon burial ground. I'll look into it later. Peter dismissed these thoughts as he turned to Charles. It seems you were voted first. I know what you're all thinking. Charles says as he pushes his chair forward. All I can say is that you shouldn't get your hopes up. I've come to terms with my situation long ago, so you should too. Although everyone, except Eric, believed him, Charles couldn't help but hope deep down inside to walk again. His minor telekinesis may make his situation a bit more manageable, but at the end of the day, being able to walk again would change his life forever. All right, give me a second. Peter says as he hits a button, causing the chamber to open and tilt backward. Since Charles can't stand, they made the chamber handicap accessible. After a few moments, the chamber was completely open and laying horizontally, so that Charles could lie inside. All right, hop in. Peter says and Charles floats out of his chair and into the chamber. I wish you the best, my friend. Eric says sincerely, shocking everyone present. Charles merely looks over in shock as the metal bindings eject, strapping him into place. Are you ready? Peter asks as he gets ready to start the process. Yes. Charles nods with a solemn look on his face. All right. Peter says as he closed the chamber with a push of a button. Without further ado, Peter flicked the switch that injected the needles into the professor's body. Although he was surprised by the sudden pain, he didn't have it as bad as Tony, as Charles couldn't feel the needles in the lower half of his body. Ouch. As Charles's surprised and pained voice exclaimed, Eric stared worriedly at the sealed chamber. Though he hid it well. Injection complete. Peter says as all of the vials that were once filled with blue serum are now empty. Hit him with the Vita radiation, Tony. Got it. Tony replies as he flips a switch and automatically starts ramping up the percentage of Vita rays. They've been through this many times with the animals, and even Tony went through it personally, so this was all just repeating the steps to a known outcome. Ah. Charles's screams grew louder as the dial grew closer to 100%. As the screams reached their peak, Peter could tell that Charles was somehow experiencing more pain than Tony, which was impossible as he would only feel it in half of his body. Stop the machine. Eric exclaims as he feared for his friend's life. He can't handle it. After joining the Avengers together, Eric and Charles have slowly started warming up to one another again. The two used to be like brothers before their split in ideology turned them into mortal enemies. Thankfully, that brotherly love was slowly returning, which can be seen by Eric's recent outburst. Although he practically ordered Peter and Tony to stop, neither of them bothered paying Magneto any attention, as the procedure was only moments from its end. I said stop or I'll do it myself. Eric says as the metal chamber doors began to rattle. No, don't stop. Charles screams from the chamber. I can feel. I can feel my legs. Upon hearing Charles's words, the entire room grew still. Though that didn't last long as Charles started yelling in agony again. Eric instantly stopped manipulating the metal chamber as he stepped back and waited patiently. Although he was worried that the pain would send Charles into shock and kill his best friend, Eric knew that the professor would never forgive him if he took away his chance at walking again. Moments later, Charles's screaming died down as the Vita radiation hit 100%. That should be enough. Pierce says as he turns to Tony, shut it down. As the old school machinery shut down, cutting the flow of Vita rays down to zero, everyone gathered in front of the chamber in anticipation. Open it up. Eric orders, receiving a scoff from Peter as he hit the button. Since he's worried, I'll let the attitude go for today. Peter thought as the chamber opened. When the steam cleared and the doors were fully open, everyone was shocked to find a muscular bald man who appeared to be around 50 years old. Looking good professor. Peter comments as Charles gasps for air with sweat covering his body. As a man in his mid-seventies, Charles looked amazing. He had the appearance of a 50-year-old man that exercised and took perfect care of himself. Compared to your average 50-year-old, who doesn't have time to maintain a peak-level body, Charles might as well look to be in his 40s. Well, I'm not feeling good. He quips back at Peter as the metal restraints release. With his arms and legs unbound, everyone's gaze fell on the professor's legs. Sigh. Charles let out a calming breath as he tried, for the first time in many years, to move his legs. Twitch. Immediately, his feet twitch, and moments later his legs move. Sitting up with just his core strength alone, Charles swings his legs over the side of the chamber and sits in shock, his legs dangling over the edge. I am moving my legs. Tears fill his eyes as Charles hops off the metal chamber bed and steps both feet on the ground. Silence fills the room as Charles doesn't collapse as he expected. Congratulations, Professor. Peter was the first to speak as everyone watched Charles stand under his own power with tears streaming down his cheeks. Thank you. He says wholeheartedly. You're very welcome, though there is one problem. Peter says, drawing everyone's attention. I'm afraid that the procedure didn't cure you completely. What? What do you mean? Eric asks in confusion. Charles. You're still bald. Peter wipes an imaginary tear from his mask. I'm so sorry. Chapter 167, C-167 Happy Birthday to Me. Once Charles's emotions calmed down and he got used to walking around again, Peter and Tony continued with the procedures. It didn't take long for both Eric and Fury to get their upgraded bodies as well. Just like Charles, both of them seemed to revert back about 20 years. Not only that, but they also gained a perfect physique alongside a few inches in height. 
While they were going through the procedure, Charles paced around the room, putting his new legs to work almost constantly. He hasn't stopped moving since his feet hit the floor. Peter thought as he watched with a wry smile on his face. Similar to Charles and his legs, Fury's eye was restored back to perfect working order, which he wasn't exactly thankful for. Now I have to change so many authorization scans. Fury sulked at the work that now needed to be done. Ever since Mystique used his eye scan to infiltrate S.H.I.E.L.D. and steal the Tesseract, Fury went out of his way to make every single authorization scan his destroyed eye. Though now all of that work was pointless. Fury used to be sensitive about the subject of his injured eye and never talked about why he wears an eye patch. Tony bothered him for a week straight, as his curiosity couldn't be contained, though Fury never revealed a single detail. Of course, Tony wouldn't be beaten and tried hacking the information from S.H.I.E.L.D.'s servers, but found nothing to answer his burning questions. Meanwhile, when that was happening, Peter did his best to contain his laughter. It was revealed in the Captain Marvel movie that Fury lost his eye when Goose scratched him. Fury wasn't hiding some classified mission or sorrowful loss on the battlefield, no he was hiding the embarrassing truth that he lost the use of his eye to a simple cat scratch. Well, Goose is an alien cat but still. Peter thought as he watched Fury across the room without his eye patch. It seems that I'll have to change your contact in my phone from bald cyclops to something else. My name should do the trick. Fury rolls both of his eyes for the first time in a long while. Nah, that's too boring. Peter says with a shake of his head. Mad milk dad. Tony offers his thoughts from the side. Oh, I like that. Peter says as he whips out his phone and changes Fury's contact name. I hate you both so much. Fury says with a deadpan look on his face. Once everyone was finished, Peter looked over the Avengers four new super soldiers and gave them an approving nod. With the way things are going, Thanos won't stand a chance. Peter thought with conviction. All right, go and test out your new bodies in the gym. If you have any problems, contact us and we'll figure it out. Especially Eric and Charles. You two have the X gene, which is an unknown variable. Just be sure to let us know of any issues. Before they could leave, Peter remembered one last thing. Also, each of you can put one name forward in the next council meeting to receive the super soldier serum. Peter reveals, piquing the three council members' interest. We'll have to vote for each person, and as long as they are Avengers, then they can go through the same procedure as all of us. As soon as these words left Peter's mouth, each of them already had names appear in their heads. Fury thought of both Clint and Natasha. Eric thought of Mystique and Victor, though Victor's chances in a council vote would be slim to none. After all, giving such a hot-headed person even more power probably wouldn't be for the best. Lastly, Charles thought of Storm and Logan. The question was which ones would they choose, as Peter only allowed them one name per person. At least for now. After some words of appreciation were given, Charles, Eric, and Fury all marched out of Tony's workshop and proceeded to the gym, where they would break in their new bodies. Well, I guess it's my turn now. Peter says as he turns to look at the open chamber. Yup, strip, and hop on in. Tony says as he wondered how much stronger Peter would get, as he was already the second strongest Avenger. Of course, number one is the Hulk, though Banner still doesn't let him out to play due to his own misguided fear. All right, lock down the workshop. I don't need Pepper walking in again. Peter says as Tony hits a button. Lockdown initiated? Jarvis informs them as thick metal doors seal every entrance and window. Get on with it. Tony says impatiently. Careful, you might prove Pepper right. Peter says jokingly as his spider suit disappears and is replaced with his normal clothes, revealing Peter's unmasked face. Pepper doesn't think that I'm G asterisk Y. Tony exclaims in exasperation. Right. Peter says sarcastically as he strips down to his underwear. Let's get a move on. Stepping into the chamber, Peter was instantly strapped down by metal restraints. Technically, he could break them with a simple tug but Peter would do his best not to destroy the chamber. You ready? Tony asks as the earlier air of joking disappears. Yep, start it up. Peter calls out and just as he spoke the doors close, locking him inside. From the small eye level window, Peter could see Tony press a button. Only a second later, the needles shout out and pierced his skin. This is like one of those torture machines. Peter thought as he regretted making this design. Although he didn't make a sound of surprise like everyone else, Peter was still a little bit weirded out by the needles. As each needle dug into him, Peter could feel a liquid pouring into his body from each individual point. Odd. Peter muttered as a strange feeling washed over him. When the needles stopped shooting out the serum and retracted out of his skin, Peter knew what was about to happen and mentally prepared for it. Starting Vita radiation. Tony says loud enough for Peter to hear. Here comes the hard part. Peter thought as a blinding light filled the chamber. It started off manageable, but soon the burning pain Peter felt all over his body started getting more and more intense. He felt as though he was floating closer and closer to the sun, burning hotter with every inch forward. Aaaaa. Soon enough, Peter began to scream. He thought that he could persevere and hold it all in, but it seems that he was no better than the four other men that had just gone through the same process. What was most annoying, however, was the fact that Peter had to endure all of this pain, while also doing his best to not destroy the chamber. One wrong move and he could break his restraints and rip a hole in the metal doors. When Peter's agonizing screams rang out from the chamber, Tony sighed in relief. The dial had spun all the way up to 80% without a sound from Peter, so he was worried that something had gone wrong. 
Everyone else started letting out their pain-filled voices at around 30%, so Tony was beyond impressed by his friend. Whether it was willpower or pain tolerance, he was impressed either way. As the dial hit 100%, Peter went back to complete silence. Giving the Vita Rays an extra moment to do their work, Tony shut everything down and hit the button to open the chamber. Once again, steam came pouring out and moved along the floor, revealing a half-baked Peter Parker with a light sheen of sweat coating his entire body. Huh. Tony grunted in confusion as he caught a glimpse of his friend. You don't look any different. As Tony says this, the restraints retract and Peter steps out of the chamber, meeting Tony eye to eye. You're wrong. Peter says as he compared his height to Tony's. I'm taller. Yeah, but that's about it. Tony shrugs as he steps out of the way so that Peter could use the mirror. Peter silently stared at himself in the mirror, looking for any changes in his body. Other than the fact that he grew about 3 inches, rounding his height out at 6 foot 3 inches, Peter could also see some small changes in his muscles. Peter retained his lean body type, but the muscles on his body looked to be much more defined than before, which certainly wasn't a bad thing. Hmm, not bad. Peter muttered as he turned away from the mirror and reached for his clothes. Creak. As soon as his hand made contact with the metal table, where Peter's clothes sat folded, both Tony and Peter were surprised to see the table bend downwards from just the lightest touch. What the? Chapter 168, C-168 Public Theft. Creak. Seeing the thick metal table bend as Peter lightly grazed it with his fingertips, they both knew for a fact that Peter's strength increased by a large margin. Looks like I will be spending the next couple of days learning how to control my strength again. Peter says with an exasperated sigh. Whatever, it shouldn't be that hard. No fair. Tony starts whining like a child. I finally get superpowers and you jump way ahead of me again. It's like nothing changed at all. One of the main reasons that Tony wanted to get his own powers was because of Peter. On one hand, he wanted to catch up to his friend, and on the other, Tony just wanted to shut him up. After all, Peter did make a lot of jokes about him being the weakest Avenger, physically. Sucks to be you, I guess. Peter smirks as he shrugs his shoulders. Stupid spider bee asterisk starred. Tony grumbled as he paced out of the room and he turned to yell over his shoulder. I'm going to drink away my pain. For the rest of the week leading up to the meeting with the current Nova Prime, Peter spent most of his time in the Avenger gym, slowly but surely gaining back control of his immense strength. After running some tests, Peter found that he was just a little over four times stronger than he was before. Before the Super Soldier Serum, and through many hours of hard work, Peter was able to increase his strength up to lifting 50,000 pounds, meaning that he could now lift over 200,000 pounds or 100 tons. Hehe, <laughs> I'm the strongest. The narcissistic part of Peter's brain started acting up as he bench-pressed that exact weight. I told you it's unfair. Tony says to his peers as he and the other council members watched in shock. Ever since they received the super soldier serum, each of them started attending the gym more often in order to fully familiarize themselves with their new bodies. Through the hours spent in the gym, all of them have already learned the boundaries of their strength, which is just a measly 5 tons or 10,000 pounds. Of course, that amount wasn't anywhere near measly, but compared to Peter's increase in power they couldn't help but feel like tiny powerless ants. Though, they could increase their strength with hard work as Peter did. One night, while Peter was attending the gym alone, Jarvis made his presence known. Sir, I have a list of 27 companies and government facilities that stashed away a portion of Chitori technology. Jarvis' voice plays in the gym like a disembodied ghost. Huh. Peter stops his current set and racks the enormous weight. Send the list of locations and any other useful information to my phone. Sent, sir. Jarvis says as Peter feels his phone vibrate in his pocket. Thanks for your hard work, Jarvis. Peter says as he gets up and walks out of the gym. It's my pleasure, sir. As Peter ascended the tower and walked out onto the roof, he took out his phone and dialed a number. How can I be of service, Black Sky? Scythe answers in a very respectful tone. Scythe has been a very loyal and hardworking subordinate. He practically runs the day-to-day -day operations of the hand, while sending Peter constant updates and status reports. Peter makes the big decisions, and Scythe implements them. It's a good relationship in Peter's eyes, as he is already a very busy man. Maybe I'll make Scythe the director of whichever department the hand ends up becoming in the future. Peter thought as he returned to the conversation at hand. How has the hand been progressing? Smoothly, since my last progress report, we have expanded to another three cities. Wherever the hand goes, crime rates dip to all-time lows. Scythe answered proudly. This is the way the hand should have been all along. Well, better late than never. Peter says as he copies the information from Jarvis and texts it to Scythe. I just sent you a list of locations. The owners decided to go against my words and keep Chitori technology. The hand will have everything by tomorrow, sir. Would you like us to send a message? Scythe asks, hinting at spilling some blood. If they deserve it. Peter says without care. Though feel free to steal anything that looks valuable and burn everything else. If you find any misdeeds, feel free to anonymously contact the local authorities as well. Yes, sir. Sigh the firms, already sending messages to teams across the world as they spoke. Good, talk to you later. Peter says as he hangs up the phone and walks back inside the tower. After days of waiting, the time finally came to attend the meeting on Xander. Days before this, Peter shocked everyone in the tower by opening a portal and dumping tons of Chitori technology at the at their doorstep. 
Just as this was happening, the news was spreading about thefts and arson across multiple companies and government facilities. The two events were immediately linked as the world remembered Peter's words. Anyone caught harboring any of these scraps will be heavily punished. This is a message to everyone, governments, companies, organizations, and citizens alike. Things became specially clear after some CEOs admitted to harboring the tech, trying to use that information to attack Spider-Man and make him return their property. Though no one seemed to care, and even if they did, Peter still wouldn't give anything back. It wasn't hard to see that the owners of these burned locations didn't listen to Spider-Man's warning, and were now paying the price for their foolish actions. Many CEOs and high-level government officials were arrested as well, which was like icing on the cake. On the same day, they were playing the victim with tears in their eyes, these people were swiftly carried off by police on anonymous tips alongside irrefutable evidence to back up the claims. In a single day, many people were sent to jail and even a few companies went out of business. Better yet, this all happened while Peter was patrolling New York City, so he had a perfect alibi, though he didn't really need one. Even if everyone knew this was his doing, they couldn't prove a thing. What made the whole situation funny was the news coverage, which completely took Peter's side and treated the other parties as idiots that picked a fight with Spider-Man. Another CEO arrested and found guilty of tax evasion. One newscaster said as he tried his best to hold back a smirk. I guess we can add him to the list, huh? Though that wasn't the best part. Each company and government spoke out and pretty much disavowed the people that were involved, throwing them completely under the bus while doing all they could to save their own a asterisk ses. After all, having bad blood with Spider-Man and the Avengers is something that could kill companies and topple governments. Just a tweet from Peter could start boycotts, protests, and possibly even revolutions, which is why these people were so quickly turned into sacrificial lambs. Of course, Peter knew that the people putting out these statements were at least privy to what was going on, though he didn't have any dirt on them, so they would get away this time around. Though one thing came from all of this that Peter expected to happen sooner or later, so he wasn't surprised or worried. The Avengers have figured out that Peter has some lackeys outside of their group. As Peter was all over the internet last night, saving people all across New York, someone had to be doing the dirty work and it sure wasn't them. Most people in the Avengers didn't care much, but Fury and Tony were certainly interested in this new information. Come on, tell me who it is. Tony asked for the millionth time as the two waited for the other council members to arrive, so they could head off to Xander for their meeting. It's an ancient order of killer zombie ninjas. Peter says truthfully, though he masked it as a joke. I picked them up in Japan. Be serious. Tony pouted once again. Aren't I your best friend? Technically, you're one of my best friends, but yeah. Peter says with a shrug. Sure, but I'm number one, right? Tony asks expectantly. Peter stays quiet and just stared the other direction. Right. Tony asks again, sounding a bit more desperate this time. Thankfully, before Peter was forced to pick between Tony and Ned, the other council members arrived. Are we late? Charles asks as he walks in followed by Fury and Eric. No, Tony was just showing me what clingy and desperate looks like. Peter says, causing Tony to flinch and hold his heart in pain. Is everyone ready to go? I'm not clingy. Chapter 169, C-169 Xander. Opening a portal, Peter and the Avengers Council stepped out in front of a towering militarized building. All around them was a futuristic metropolis with ships flying here and there. This is way better than Morag. Tony mutters as he and everyone else spin in a circle to get a good look at their surroundings. Of course, the ships stayed clear of the huge military building, though they seemed to be allowed to fly just about everywhere else. The amazing part about the city was the plethora of greenery. If an area didn't have some sort of purpose, then in its place would be a patch of grass, trees, and slash or bushes. It would be hard to implement something like this in New York. Peter thought as he compared Xander's capital city to his own concrete jungle. Welcome. An older woman with white blonde hair and an alien military-style blue suit walks out of the building. When Jarvis said that you could open portals, I must say that I didn't believe him. Insert picture of Irani Rail here. Staring at the golden portal behind her new guests, Irani Rail descended the steps of the Nova Corps headquartered followed by a small group of armed soldiers, who watched the group of Avengers vigilantly. Speaking of Jarvis, which of you would that be? Irani says as she stands in front of the group. That would be me, ma'am. The speakers from Tony's suit go off, though his face mask was open so she knew that he wasn't the one that answered. It's a pleasure to finally meet you in person. Hmm, an automation. Irani asks in confusion, as she originally thought that Jarvis was a flesh and blood person. Jarvis is an artificial intelligence. Peter says as the portal behind them closes. We had him contact you because he has complete control of Ronan's old fleet. It was the easiest method. I see. She says and turns back to Tony. Either way, it's a pleasure to meet you as well, Jarvis. For an advanced society like the Xandarians, a being like Jarvis wasn't anything new. In fact, high enough level AI can register as citizens of the Nova Empire and receive the same rights as any living being. Should we talk inside? Peter asks as the crowd grew silent for a moment. Yes, right this way. She nods and leads the group to the main entrance of the building, where even more armed guards stood with solemn and serious looks. I'm afraid that weapons aren't allowed past this point. You'll have to leave them with the guards. As Irani says this, a few guards move toward them with carts to hold their guests' weaponry. 
With a shrug of his shoulders, Peter took his new hammer from his back and placed it on the cart. As soon as the Nova Corps members saw this hammer, they couldn't help but look at Peter in respect. After all, how could they not recognize the signature weapon of one of their biggest enemies? Seeing Peter following their rules, the others started offloading their weaponry as well. Of course, Tony was a bit stuck, as he didn't want to hand over his Iron Man armor, so under the gazes of the very serious guards, he stood unmoving and unwilling to follow along. Huh. Noticing this, Peter offers Tony a choice. Tony, you can either stay out here and explore the city, or I can send your armor back to the tower and you can join us inside. Tony's ears perked up at the possibility of skipping on the inevitably long meeting that was about to unfold. See ya. Without a second thought, Tony waved as he turned around and shot off into the air to explore. As Tony flew off, they all watched as he almost crashed into a small transport ship, though he was able to maneuver his way around it at the last second. Why give him the choice to slack off? Charles asks with an annoyed frown. He'll always choose that option. It's fine, Tony isn't exactly needed and he tends to become annoying during long meetings, so this is for the best. Peter says with a shrug as he turns to Irani. Please continue. Yes, just one more thing. She says as her gaze falls on Fury. Please turn in all of your weapons. A staring contest ensued between the two before Fury sighed and walked back over to the cart. With an annoyed look on his face, Fury started unloading weapon after weapon from his body. The guards watched in shock as over and over, Fury pulled weapons out of nowhere and handed them over. Three pistols, five knives, a taser, and a few other miscellaneous weapons later and they were finally allowed inside. Following after Irani while admiring the alien architecture, they arrived at a meeting room with a large balcony that overlooked the city outside. Please have a seat. She offers as an egg-shaped table and chairs appear out of the floor. All right, let's get straight to business. Peter says as he takes a seat at the head of the table with the view of the city behind him. The guards that followed Irani around didn't look pleased by this action, though their boss didn't seem to care, as she simply sat somewhere else, so they kept their mouths shut. Yes, should we start with introductions? She asks as everyone was seated. My name is Irani Rail. I control the Nova Corps as Nova Prime. Spider-Man, I fight crime and protect the Earth. I'm also a co-founder of the Avengers with everyone else in this room. Peter says as everyone else introduces themselves next. Avengers. She asks as everyone seemed to mention that name. The Avengers is a bit like the Nova Corps, except that we're all enhanced individuals. Peter reveals, receiving a raised brow from the Nova Prime. It's very rare to find so many enhanced individuals in one place, and you're all from Planet C-53. She asks, curious to know what was so special about Earth. Especially since C-53 has a reputation as a very weak and primitive planet. Yeah, we're all native to the Earth. Peter says as he waved his hand. Is that how you were able to defeat? As she was speaking, a golden portal opened above the table and an open coffin fell out, landing on the table with a light bang. Ronan. As she said his name, Ronan the accuser could be seen laying lifeless inside the coffin with his head disconnected from his shoulders. Peter was tired of her probing questions and decided to get the show on the road. They could answer all of her questions once they were officially allies. I know it's not the most pleasant gift, but it proves our claims. We also have a detention center filled with his surviving subordinates. If you're interested, that is. Peter reveals. Peter hoped she would take the Kree soldiers, as he had no idea what to do with all of them. He and Tony have already run all of the tests they could on them, so they were just taking up space at this point. We would be happy to take all of them off of your hands. Irani says as she motions for the nearby guards to take the coffin away. At this point in the meeting, Irani Rail has already noticed who the leader of these people was. They didn't have to say a word for her to see how Spider-Man took the lead during this whole encounter. Good, I'll deliver them later. Peter nods as the coffin is carried off. Now on to the real business. How does the Nova Empire feel about starting an alliance with us? The room goes quiet for a moment as Irani looks a bit embarrassed. The Emperor isn't interested in any alliances at the moment. She says with an ashamed look on her face. Was it Thanos' name that scared him off, or the fact that we're an unknown planet? Peter asks, unbothered by her answer. He expected this to happen after all. If I'm being honest, both. Irani admits. She spent the last few days petitioning to the Emperor and anyone that would listen, hoping to help form an alliance with Earth, though sadly, it wasn't a possibility. Of course, she wouldn't give up petitioning for this alliance. Especially after hearing about the number of enhanced individuals on C-53, Irani had a gut feeling that there was something special about the Earth and would follow that feeling, as it helped her get this far in life. Although we can't be allies at this very moment, I was however able to secure a handsome reward for your good deeds. She says as a hologram appears from the table, showing a large fleet of Kree warships. These are captured warships from our recent war against the Kree Empire. Some are perfectly functional while others as in need of some love. They now belong to you. The plan was simple. If she couldn't ally with them, then she would arm them up enough to help in their fight against Thanos and anyone else that would come knocking. This move would strengthen their relationship and still leave room for a possible alliance in the future. The best part was that these ships were going to be scrapped anyway, so the loss on their part was practically nothing. I was not expecting this. Peter thought as he saw the ships. Chapter 170, C-170 Honey Trap Seeing the offering of what appeared to be over 40 Kree warships, though some of them looked to be in pretty bad shape, 
Peter couldn't help but think of his home country. The United States has a long history of arming and funding groups across the world to do their dirty work, so this situation wasn't exactly a new phenomenon. In fact, it was funny to see that even an advanced multi-galaxy spanning empire would pull the same tricks as a relatively new country on some backwater planet. Although Peter didn't like the fact that the Nova Empire was pretty much saying we want nothing to do with it. Here are some leftover ships, go and kill Thanos, he found it impossible to turn down their offer. At least they know the right gifts to give. Peter thought as he admired the spacecrafts. Off to the side, Fury and the rest of the Avengers Council understood this as well. They weren't exactly happy either, but who were they to turn down such a nice gift? Fury understood this move the most, as he worked in this sort of business for all of his life. It just so happens that the roles have reversed this time around. Although it isn't the outcome we were hoping for, the ships will come in handy. Peter says, receiving an understanding nod from Irani Rail. If it means anything, I try to push for an alliance, but no one seems to be willing to stand up against Thanos. The Mad Titan is a subject that most simply want to ignore, which is a stance that I don't agree with. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Peter quotes something he heard back in his past life. Those people who would rather keep their heads in the sand and hope they're left alone will sooner or later regret their actions. After a short talk, in which Irani promised to keep petitioning for an alliance with them, the Avengers bid their farewells, picked up their weapons, and left the building in search of Tony, though they really just wanted to sightsee for a little while. Sadly, Peter had to stay behind, as he had to offload the Kree prisoners onto the Nova Corps. Someone had to do the boring work, and as usual, the burden was placed on him. We need to get a new member that can use portals. Peter thought as he escorted batches of Kree prisoners through portals with the help of Irani and her soldiers. Hours later, the transport was finished and every Kree was safely imprisoned in the Nova Corps headquarters, where they were identified and charged with all sorts of horrible crimes. If it would help with their charges, I can have Jarvis send over any incriminating evidence from the databanks of Ronan's ships. Peter offered as he saw the way they were each processed. Yes, that would be great. Irani nodded as they watched the Nova Corps members at work. Sadly, we can't just throw them in prison forever based on their alignment alone. The Nova Empire has many laws protecting the rights of every being, so without evidence, a small portion of them would most likely be deported back to their home world. All right, I'll have Jarvis send over everything by tomorrow. After saying his goodbyes, Peter finally left for the city, where he immediately went looking for Tony. He needed to get the new Kree ships back to Earth and Tony was the best man for the job. With Jarvis' help, Peter was able to find Tony pretty easily. The only problem was the location that Jarvis led him to. Are you sure that he's in here? Peter asked down at his phone. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers back instantly. The readings show Mr. Stark's Iron Man armor inside. Right in front of Peter was a pure white marble building with naked alien women showing themselves off in the windows. Projected onto the bottom of the windows were prices per hour in units. Units, also known as credits, are the main form of intergalactic currency used across many planets. Each alien woman had vibrant skin tones from colors like pink, green, blue, and many more. A few of them had large eyes and even one has four arms, though each of them was beautiful and appealing in their own way. He really went to an alien brothel. Peter thought with a small hint of jealousy as he admired the view of all the naked alien women. How did he even get the credits? Peter isn't the type to betray his significant other and sleep around, so the most he could do is enjoy the view while it lasted. Maybe I can convince MJ to visit this place with me. Peter thought as the idea of a three-way with a busta pink alien sounded very tempting, though he would have to look into alien STDs before doing anything. Speaking of alien STDs, Peter looked toward the building once again and wondered whether Tony thought of that before rushing inside. No, Tony is the type of person to think with his C asterisk CK before anything else. Peter thought as he walked into the brothel, ignoring the heated gazes from scantily clad women looking for a customer. As he made his way inside, Peter was stopped by some big rock-like humanoids standing guard. Are you a customer? One asks as he holds up a hand, signaling for Peter to stop. No, I'm here looking for a friend of mine. He's about my height and should be wearing red and gold armor. Peter explains. Yeah, he's in a private room. Big spender actually. The other says with a nod. You'll have to wait though. Only customers are allowed inside. Hmm, okay. Peter says as he turns around and walks out. Walking out of sight and into an alley, Peter cast the same invisibility spell on himself that he used when MJ wanted to meet Tony at the Stark Expo. Strolling back inside, Peter was able to squeeze through the big rock guards and get inside without a problem. The ground floor of the brothel seemed to be a gentleman's club with naked women everywhere. Some of them served drinks to some ugly-looking clients while others danced on various stages. Though Tony was nowhere to be seen. Lead the way, Jarvis. Peter says as his phone's GPS switches on. Following Jarvis' instructions, Peter arrived at a back room on the third floor of the building. The sounds of sweet moans, chains rattling, and leather whips could be heard from the opposite side of the door. Jarvis. Peter calls out as he hesitates to even open the door. Your creator is a degenerate. I've noticed this long ago, sir. Jarvis says in an almost mournful tone. Peter second-guessed his decisions as he contemplated leaving Tony at the brothel and returning home. I can pick up the ships tomorrow. 
Just as Peter was thinking this, the door suddenly crept open, and a naked purple woman with four eyes tiptoed out with a large red and gold briefcase in hand. Tony's suit. Peter immediately knew what the briefcase was, as Tony used that form to travel with his armor all the time. This idiot fell into a honey trap and got robbed. As soon as Peter's voice filled the hall, the woman froze in place and looked around like a kid, who was caught stealing cookies. Inside the room, Tony was blindfolded, handcuffed, and surrounded by four alien women, each of them with vibrant skin. One of them even had a third breast, which Tony was currently sucking on. Two of the women held small leather whips in hand as they took turns flogging Tony's chest every minute or so. Suddenly, the door flew open and hit the wall with a bang, scaring the woman as they screamed and jumped off of the bed. Huh. Tony mutters as the sweet alien breast leaves his mouth, still blindfolded. What's going on? At the door, Peter stood with Tony's Iron Man briefcase in one hand while a guilty-looking thief stood behind him in fear. All of you out, now. Peter orders and steps aside as the frightened alien prostitutes rush out, knowing that they've been caught. Peter. Tony asks in confusion as he pulls on his restraints. Is that you? You really are an idiot. Peter sighs as he shoots a web at Tony's head and pulls the blindfold off. I never took you for a masochist though. As a sadist, Peter was a bit disappointed in his friend's preferences, though he wouldn't judge him for it. What? Why are you here? Tony asks but soon notices the case in Peter's hand. Why do you have my armor? Chapter 171, C-171 Ripped Fatty. Time skip, 5 months. It's been months since Peter found Tony in a compromising position at that alien brothel, and a bit has happened. First, the ships that they received from the Nova Empire have been fixed and are now fully operational. Each of them has gone through a small change though. Upon looking into the system that powers the large warships, Peter and Tony found that each one had a reactor that kept everything running. Sadly, the core of the reactor was some sort of unknown element, at least to those on Earth. Seeing that this problem would come to bite them in the butt soon enough, Peter and Tony got to work and replaced every reactor with a larger version of Tony's arc reactor. Of course, every ship was powered by Batasium, Earth's very own one-of-a-kind element. This seemed to be an upgrade compared to the former power supply, which upgraded three major things in every ship. The beam cannons can now shoot a laser five times as strongly. The engines currently generate triple the power. Lastly, the shields can now stay on 24-7 outside of battle, though they would still slowly degrade if they took enough damage. Seeing that leaving the ships on Earth would be inviting certain groups to try and steal them, Peter had Jarvis fly them to specific intervals around the planet, setting up a huge defensive perimeter. All ships are in orbit around the Earth, sir. Jarvis said only minutes after Peter gave the order. Good, remember to keep the scans open at all times, and let us know if we have any more visitors. Peter instructed as he looked at a hologram of the planet, showing the exact locations of each ship. These ships have a much better capability to scan farther distances than the Stark satellites, so they would be a better warning system in case of another invasion. Speaking of an invasion, Thanos nor his armies have shown themselves yet, though the web of ships surrounding the planet isn't just for scanning. Jarvis, if there's ever another attack on the planet and nobody from the Avengers is reachable or willing to take action, feel free to activate the ships and attack. Any opposition should be taken care of outside of the planet. Peter told Jarvis thoughtfully. Just be relatively sure that they're hostile first. We wouldn't want to attack anyone for no reason. Yes, sir. Jarvis replied affirmatively. I'll run simulations for future battles. Other than finishing up the new Avengers war fleet, nothing much has happened besides something that has been a long time coming. Flashback. Sitting in the living room, Peter watched as Ned, May, Grace, and MJ all sat on the couch, waiting for his announcement. Peter, what's going on? May asks as she looks at him in confusion. She wasn't the only one either. Grace was especially surprised that she was invited, as she was only recently clued into the fact that Peter was Spider-Man, and everyone knew but her. As for Ned and MJ, they had a feeling about a few reasons for this impromptu meeting but weren't sure exactly. I have figured out a way to give all of you an extended lifespan as well as superpowers. Peter cuts right to the point. Oh, sh asterisk t. Ned exclaims as he jumps out of his seat. It's finally happening. For real. MJ asked, hoping that Peter wasn't lying to her right now. For a while now, MJ has wanted nothing more than to be able to watch Peter's back, so that she could protect the man she loves. Meanwhile, both Grace and May were surprised, though they had the same thought. Lifespan? Could it make me look younger? Both thought at the exact same time. Yup, for real. Peter says as he pulls out a vial filled with dragon bone dust. This is crushed up pieces of fossilized dragon bones. Wow. Ned uttered as he rushed over and snatched the vial from his best friend's hand. What does it do? It has a large quantity of chi, which will give you. Peter starts to explain the whole process of the resurrection elixir. And when they mix, you will get the powers of both substances combined. Peter then went on to explain their blood options. Either normal human blood, super soldier blood, or his own blood. So, we could get your powers. Ned asks with an excited glint in his eyes. MJ seemed to prefer this option too, as an interested glint appeared on her pretty face. Maybe. Peter answers unsurely. Instantly, everyone in the room looked at him funny. What does that mean? MJ asks in confusion. Isn't that what you said? Hmm, yes and no. Peter answers with a thoughtful expression. 
I learned early on that my powers were given to me by a higher power, not just because I was bitten by a special spider. So, God gave you your powers. Grace asks as that was how she interpreted Peter's words. Not exactly. Peter answers with an unknowing shrug. If I had to guess, the higher power would have to be okay with you having spider-related powers, so it's a bit of a gamble really. What if we don't want superpowers? May asks as she raises her hand like a child at school. I'm not very interested in being a hero, so I don't think that this should include me. Although May found the possibility of being young for a long time appealing, she wasn't exactly a fighter. She would fight if her loved ones were in danger but making it a full-time job like Peter wasn't in her thoughts. I'm not asking any of you to be a hero, I just want all of you to be safe. Simply having the power to defend yourselves would be more than enough. Peter says in a serious tone, which seemed to win everyone over. And if we do want to be heroes? MJ asks. Instantly, MJ's mother turns a pointed gaze in her direction. What? Grace asks, not knowing her daughter had dreams of being a hero. I want to fight alongside Peter. She admits, which causes her mother's glare to turn a bit softer. Me too. Ned joined in excitedly. After some thought, everyone came to a decision regarding their elixir. They all unanimously decided to use Peter's blood. May and Grace didn't really care, so they went with whatever Ned and MJ chose. For them, it was a gamble for Peter's overpowered spider powers. Though there really wasn't a downside, as Peter was also enhanced by the super soldier serum as well, so they would get Captain America's powers no matter what. Seeing as May and Grace didn't care much about the procedure, Ned and MJ played rock-paper-scissors to decide which of them would go first, as Peter only had one coffin-like device made, which was the same one he used on Peggy. Rock-paper-scissors, shoot. They said in unison as their hands jet forward. I win. Ned exclaims as his rock beat her scissors. I've told you a million times. They always go rock first. Peter says in an I told you so sort of tone. Shut up. Calling Ned's family beforehand, they explained that he would be spending the night at Peter's, as the procedure would most likely take the entire night. All right, good luck. Peter says as he pokes a spot on Ned's neck, which causes him to fall asleep instantly. Thankfully, he was already laying in the metal coffin, so Peter simply closed the lid and turned to see everyone else giving him questioning looks. What? It's just a pressure point. He'll be fine. Peter explains as he pulls a lever, causing the thick black elixir to fill the metal coffin, drowning Ned completely. Now what? Grace asks as the room grew silent. Now we wait. Peter replies, crushing everyone's anticipation. Want to play some board games? Hours passed as the night sky brightened and morning came along. Peter was the only one still awake, as the girls were too tired to make it past 4 a.m. Usually, MJ could stay up longer, but she got annoyed with Peter during their game of Monopoly and ran off to bed. Even in this world Monopoly can ruin families and end friendships. Peter thought with a laugh as he sipped on a cup of coffee while watching over Ned. Suddenly, the metal coffin's lid burst open and a man covered in black goo lunged out as he gasped for air. Gasp, heavy breathing. Knowing the drill, Peter walked over and used a towel to help Ned get the black elixir off of his face. I feel, different. Ned mutters as he starts wiping the black substance from his body, not noticing the changes that have occurred just yet. All of the sudden, footsteps could be heard from the stairway. Peter, do we have coffee? May came walking downstairs in pajamas and asked, though she froze in place when she saw a tall muscular naked man, wiping his body with a black gooey towel. Who's that? Chapter 172, C172 Ned's Transformation. Who's that? May asks as she saw an unfamiliar naked man in her living room. What do you mean, Ms. Parker? Ned asks in confusion, still unaware of the changes that have taken place to his body. It's me, Ned. May looked at Peter in shock as Ned stood to the side, holding a slimy towel over his family jewels. Without a word, Peter waves his hand and conjured a tall mirror in front of Ned, shocking him even more than May. Huh? Who's that? Ned repeated the same words as May as he stared at himself in the mirror. It's you, Ned. Peter says with a smirk. Not only did the elixir make Ned a few inches taller, but it also removed all of the excess fat from his body. Though the fat didn't just disappear, it was used as fuel to build a very muscular body. While Peter had a slim and muscular build, Ned now has a body similar to Steve. In short, he looks like a shredded bodybuilder. Dude. Ned mutters as he looks between both the mirror and Peter. Holy sh asterisk t. He started freaking out and without noticing he began to feel up his body, trying to make sure that the mirror wasn't some sort of illusion. I I am not fat anymore. Ned stutters as a stray tear drips down his cheek. Being the fat kid in school takes a toll, as children are very candid with their thoughts. Even teenagers will use anything against you if they don't like you enough. Flash especially, though he wasn't a bully anymore. Ned, like any other overweight kid, learned early that he had to laugh with the fat jokes, or simply ignore them depending on who was saying it. Over the years, he grew callous to anything related to his weight, as he heard it all a million times. Seeing himself as a sort of Greek god was just too much of a shock to Ned. His mind couldn't handle it as years of trauma due to his own body image came to the surface all at once. Let's get you in the shower, buddy. Seeing this happening in real time, Peter opened a portal to the bathroom and helped Ned walk through, as his body wasn't used to such a dramatic change yet. Escorting him into the shower and turning it on, Peter could still see some stray tears falling down Ned's stunned face. I'll go get you a new towel and some clothes. 
Peter says as he walks back through the portal. Peter. Ned called out, stopping Peter in his tracks. Yeah, he asks, looking over his shoulder. Thank you. Ned says emotionally. What are best friends for, right? Peter says with a warm smile as the portal closes, leaving Ned in the bathroom alone. Sometime later, Ned exited the bathroom in one of Peter's outfits, as any of his old clothes would be too large now. Although Peter's clothes were a bit tight on him, they really showed off the definition of his new body. As soon as Ned walked down to the living room, he rushed over to Peter and wrapped him in a big hug, lifting Peter off the ground with ease. This is the best day of my life. Ned exclaimed as he spun around with Peter in tow. Seated on the couch, May, Grace, and MJ watched with mixed expressions on their faces. Grace and MJ were shocked beyond belief, as they hadn't seen Ned's change yet. They saw Ned on a regular basis, especially MJ, so they didn't fully believe that the person in front of them was actually Ned. Okay okay, calm down. Peter says as Ned puts him down. Ned, is that really you? MJ asks as she walks over in surprise. Oh yeah. Ned answers excitedly as he starts flexing like a bodybuilder, though he knew none of the poses so he came off clumsy and idiotic. Yup, that's Ned. MJ thought with a roll of her eyes. So, did you get Peter's spider powers? MJ asks as soon as Ned stopped making a fool out of himself. Ah, uh, I don't know. Ned answers with a shrug. I'm definitely stronger though. That's for sure. Let's test it out. Peter declares as he walks off into the kitchen. I'll be right back. Only a minute later, without anyone noticing, an egg came flying out of the kitchen door and smacked Ned in the back of the head, exploding upon impact. What the? Ned exclaimed as he flinched and grabbed the back of his head, getting a handful of egg yolk in the process. Turning toward the kitchen door, everyone found Peter standing there with a carton of eggs in hand. Sorry, but I'm afraid you didn't win the gamble. Peter says with a shake of his head. No spider sense means that he most likely doesn't have any spider-related powers. It's okay. Ned says as he does his best to hide his disappointment. This is already more than enough. Thanks again, Peter. No problem. Peter says as he walks over and pats him on the shoulder. Although you didn't get my spider powers, it looks like you definitely got the effects of the super soldier serum. Of course, Peter already told them about his and Tony's experimenting with the serum, so they already knew. Ned smiles upon hearing Peter's words, though that smile is soon replaced by a contemplative look. I need to come up with a superhero name. You need a suit as well. Peter adds another task for him to figure out. Um, how are we supposed to explain Ned's new look? MJ asks as she realizes that they have a whole school of people to answer to, not to mention Ned's family. Silence fills the room in an instant. Since it's summer, we can explain Ned's transformation as the results of extreme diet and exercise, though people may think that you took steroids. It would be a bit hard to believe, but there shouldn't be any major problems. As for his family, we only have to worry about your parents. Peter says as he thinks for a moment. After a second of silence, Peter contemplated the possibility of performing some mind magic on Ned's parents, but soon threw that thought away. Ned, you can tell them that you woke up with superpowers. They'll probably think you're a metahuman. Just make sure to keep them quiet because having powers can attract a lot of unsavory attention. Peter explains. Hearing Peter's plan, Ned was a bit disappointed by his words. Since MJ's mother was allowed to know about everything, then he wanted to tell his parents as well. Of course, he would respect Peter's decision, as it wasn't his secret to tell in the first place. This all started with Peter, so he would have to be the one to give permission, and Peter wasn't very close to Ned's parents in the first place. They didn't have a bad relationship or anything. It's just that Ned's parents don't speak English, so there has always been a sort of language barrier between them. Maybe someday Peter would let Ned reveal everything to his parents, but that time wasn't now. As for the rest of Ned's extended family, like his grandparents, cousins, etc., they can get the same excuse as everyone at school. They don't live with him and only visit for holidays and reunions, so they weren't a problem. Sounds good. Ned nodded in agreement. Should I go and tell them now? If you want, but you'll miss out on everyone else getting their powers next. Peter says with a shrug. After some thought, Ned decided to run off home to explain the good news to his parents. He couldn't hold in the excitement and wanted to see their reactions. I'll be back tomorrow. Ned said as he ran out of the door at the fastest speed he has ever moved in his life. After some cleaning up from Ned's procedure, it was finally time for MJ to go through the same thing. Standing in front of the metal coffin, MJ looked nervous, though she was also pulsing with excitement. You ready? Peter asks as he finished refilling the elixir, made with his own blood of course. Yeah, I'm just a little nervous. She says as Peter pulls her into his chest from behind, wrapping his arms around her waist. You'll be asleep the whole time. He whispers in her ear and plants a soft kiss on her cheek. It'll be over before you even know it, I promise. Ah, Grace exclaims as she and May peek their heads out from the kitchen door, ruining the moment completely. Why are they always like this? MJ muttered as Peter let go of her. Who knows? Peter sighed alongside her. After stripping off all of her clothes off, MJ lay in the coffin completely nude, looking up at Peter who was crouched above her. Ready. Peter asks, noticing the nervous look on her face alongside the loud pounding of her beating heart. Yeah. She answers back after a short pause. Okay. Peter says as he pokes her neck the same way as Ned. Love you. Hearing Peter's sudden declaration, which he has never said before, MJ's eyes go wide as she swiftly drifts off into a deep slumber. 
Smirking at her expression, Peter closed the lid and hit the lever, releasing the elixir and starting the process. That was so cute. May practically squealed. Grace felt the same way, though she was too nervous for her daughter to show it at the moment. They always find a way to ruin the moment, don't they? Chapter 173, C-173 Spider Granny Returns Similar to Ned, Peter waited up all night, watching over the metal coffin. Though this time around he had a companion, who never left the room or took her eyes off of the coffin for a single second. You know, you can sleep if you want. Peter looked to Grace, who was worriedly staring at the coffin. I can't. She replies with a nervous sigh. I feel like I'm at her funeral. Well, that's probably the SH asterisk TTY design on my part. Peter admits, getting a small laugh from Grace. Now that I think about it, I could have made something a bit less morbid, though I was rushed at the time. The room returned to silence as the two of them sat quietly on the couch together. I'm going to make more coffee. Grace says as she walks off into the kitchen with an empty mug in hand. Hours pass as both Peter and Grace sat in the living room. Since Peter was used to this and confident in the procedure's success, he started playing on his phone as the night went on. So far, two procedures like this have gone through with perfect results, so he wasn't that worried. On the other hand, Grace chugged caffeine all night and stayed vigilant, ready for some sort of horrible incident to occur at any moment. Huh. MJ grunted as she awoke in an unfamiliar place. Surrounding her was an odd-looking dimension that seemed to be separated by spider webs. MJ breathed heavily as she stood up from the floor and looked around, shocked and frightened by this random turn of events. Only moments ago, her boyfriend said he loved her for the first time and put her to sleep so that she could receive the resurrection elixir. Where am I? She thought. In between the web-like structure of this unimaginable dimension, different versions and outcomes of what appeared to be her life played out over and over. As if she was watching multiple televisions, MJ witnessed all sorts of lives that she could or would have lived. From mundane lives, where she lived like a normal person with a job, husband, and children, to lives that are much more fantastical, where she became a hero in her own right. Ignoring the boring lives, as they didn't interest her one bit, especially since most of them didn't include Peter, MJ watched the lives that looked far more interesting. In every one of them, she would become a spider-related hero that went by all sorts of names. Spider Woman. Spider Girl. Silk. Ghost Spider. Etc. MJ watched as different versions of herself fought familiar and unfamiliar villains, using her powers and smarts to stop crime and protect civilians. What is this? She muttered in confusion. It's you? The voice of an elderly woman fills the spider web dimension. Following the sound, MJ turns to see an old decrepit looking woman with spider-like appendages sitting on a stone throne. Not only does she have eight black spider legs coming out of her back, but also multiple beady black eyes on her wrinkled face. The Great Weaver. Ah, I can see that, but how and why? MJ asks back, stunned by the mutant looking woman. Across the infinite multiverse, Michelle Jones Watson always has a 50-50 chance of being something great. The old spidery woman says as she gestures to the playing images. Which will it be this time? A mundane life as anyone else, or something more? Who are you? MJ asks, unsure of whether she could trust the woman before her. That doesn't matter. The Great Weaver shakes her head, unwilling to answer any questions. Just know that I'm the one who bestowed power to the man whom you cherish so dearly. Wait. MJ speaks, remembering what Peter said only yesterday. I learned early on that my abilities were given to me by a higher power, not just because I was bitten by a special spider. I see. MJ mutters as she figured out what was going on. Did I win the gamble? Not yet, no. The spider granny answered with a creepy knowing smirk, easily reading MJ's thoughts. Did you just? MJ asks as she feels oddly violated. Yes. The great weaver's smile only widens upon seeing her reaction. That's not an invasion of privacy at all. MJ says with a heavy bit of sarcasm. You act as if I don't know everything about you already. The elderly woman says with a cackle. MJ frowned as she felt naked in front of the cosmic being across from her. Enough of that? The Great Weaver said as she stopped laughing and looked at MJ seriously. So, what is your choice, girly? What do you mean? MJ asks, not understanding what she meant. Sigh, I forgot how annoying it is to deal with you mortals. Spider Granny comments rudely. Sorry. MJ apologizes unsurely. Well, you can't help it, I suppose. She responds with an uncaring shrug. Let me spell it out for you. Would you like to get similar powers to your future husband? MJ's eyes go wide open as she heard that. Oops, how careless of me. The Great Weaver says, as though she didn't mean to reveal that little tidbit. Future husband. MJ repeats questioningly. Well, he could be. She replies in an uncaring tone. Nothing is set in stone after all. Aye aye. MJ didn't know how to reply to that. Well, I've wasted enough time. Choose now or I'll choose for you. The elderly woman gives her an ultimatum. At that moment, MJ froze as she saw the woman before her about to open her mouth once again. I want the powers. Seeing that her choice was almost taken away from her, MJ acted quickly and shouted her answer before it was too late. Good. The Great Weaver smirked as she waved her hand. Instantly, with the wave of her hand, a great force impacted MJ's body and knocked her backward. Huh. MJ grunted as the force hit her and she flew into a small spider web-shaped portal. As Peter was tapping away on his phone, Grace was fidgeting in her seat from the copious amounts of caffeine that she consumed to stay up all night. 
As a single working mother, Grace hasn't pulled an all-nighter like this in years, so the night was rather grueling for the worried woman. Asterisk clang? Gasp? Asterisk. Just as she was about to go and make another cup of coffee, the lid of the metal coffin flew off and fell to the floor, as a black sludge-covered woman shot out with a loud gasp for oxygen. Oh, thank God. Grace exclaimed as she rushed over and hugged her daughter without a care for the messy substance covering her body. Excuse me? Peter says as he joins the mother and daughter duo and starts wiping MJ's face so that she could open her eyes. Heavy breathing. MJ slowly caught her breath as Peter wiped all of the black gunk from her face. Hey there, beautiful. Peter smiles as he gets a clear look at her. Aye aye. MJ starts to speak but she didn't have the lung capacity just yet. I love you too. At that instant, Grace felt like a third wheel to her daughter's budding romance and backed up to give the two some space. Good to know. Peter smiled as he kissed her dirty black lips, uncaring as the used elixir gets on his face. Let's get you in the shower, shall we? Hearing Peter's obviously flirtatious invitation to bathe together, MJ nods with a small blush on her face. Meanwhile, Grace watched the whole thing with a heated look on her face. Why couldn't Nick be like that? She thought, imagining herself and Fury in their place. While Grace was off in her own imagination, which is something she seems to have picked up from May, Peter opened a portal to his bathroom and carried MJ out of the metal coffin bridal style. We'll be back in a bit. Peter says over his shoulder as the portal closes behind them, leaving MJ's exhausted and caffeine-ravaged mother in the living room alone, daydreaming about who knows what. Chapter 174, C-174 MJ's Transformation While sharing a hot and steamy shower with MJ, who couldn't fully control her body due to the recent procedure, Peter was sure to wash every corner of her body lovingly. Of course, this embarrassed MJ to no end, but she certainly wasn't complaining. Sadly, before the two lovebirds could get too ahead of themselves, Peter noticed something odd while cleaning his lovely girlfriend's arms. What's this? Peter muttered as he found something that wasn't there before. He spent many an hour studying her body, so Peter would be able to spot any differences fairly quickly. MJ now has two small holes in her wrists, which matched the same holes that Peter had in the same location. Huh. MJ looked down and saw what Peter was looking at. Suddenly, as Peter was studying her wrists, MJ involuntarily discharged some web, which shot Peter square in the face, blocking his vision as it stuck to him like tape. Holy sh asterisk t. MJ exclaimed as she watched it all happen with her newly enhanced vision. Oh my god. Are you okay? Yeah. Peter replies as he pulls the webs off with ease and tosses them to the side. Congrats, you seem to have gotten my powers. Yeah, about that. MJ says as she starts to explain what happened to her when she fell asleep. Huh, so you met the great weaver too. Peter says as they walk out of the shower and start drying off. Yeah, though she didn't tell me her name or title. MJ replies as they continue into his room, looking for clothes to wear. She was really creepy. I know, she was like that with me too. Peter says with a shrug, as he sits on his bed and watches MJ get dressed. I really love my life. Although MJ took good care of herself before this, after the procedure from last night, Peter could see some differences in his beautiful girlfriend's naked body. First, she was maybe an inch taller. Second, MJ's body was just all around tighter than before. A big reason for this newfound tightness was the thin layer of muscles that now appeared all over her body, though nobody would actually be able to notice them unless she exerted herself in some way. Surprisingly, and to Peter's love and amazement, something else may have occurred during the process last night. MJ. Peter says, drawing MJ's attention toward him. Did your butt get bigger? What? MJ utters in surprise as she looks at a standing mirror in the corner and turns to get a good look at her backside. Is it? Just as Peter thought, her butt was a bit thicker than before. Nothing too crazy but she most definitely had some more substance back there. Yeah, it's probably the muscles in your butt. Peter says as he caught sight of her chest next. I don't think that's the only thing either. Huh. MJ muttered as she follows Peter's gaze to see what he was looking at. Looking down at her breasts, MJ instantly noticed a change this time around. Throughout her life, MJ was cursed with below average sized breasts. She didn't really mind, but seeing them gain a bit of plumpness was shocking to her. She was a B cup only last night and now MJ seemed to be somewhere in the C cup range. But that's not related to muscle. MJ says and turns to Peter for answers. Don't look at me. Peter says with a shrug. I have no idea why your breasts would get bigger, though I certainly have no problem with it. Seeing the perverted smirk on her boyfriend's face, MJ couldn't help but huff and turn away, guarding her breasts against his hungry eyes. Though doing so only left her backside defenseless. I'm really happy you took the elixir. Peter says as MJ could feel his gaze on her butt. I hate you right now. After MJ received her powers, the next two days were filled with May and Grace receiving theirs, though, like Ned, they only got Peter's super soldier abilities. Of course, they didn't mind, as they were only in it for the beauty aspect, which did not disappoint. Since the two of them didn't appear that old, as they took good care of themselves through skin care, hygiene, diet, etc., they didn't age as much as people like Eric and Charles. The both of them already looked to be in their mid-twenties beforehand after all, though that doesn't mean the results weren't in their favor. Wrinkles disappeared, skin was cleared and tightened, slim muscles were formed, hair was rejuvenated, and much much more. 
if before their procedures the two of them were 35-year-olds that could pass themselves off as being in their 20s with some makeup and extreme care for their bodies, now they didn't need anything to look the part. I can't stop looking at myself. May comments as she and Grace were stuck naked in front of a large mirror, gawking at themselves. My asterisk S has never been this tight before. Grace says as she stands sideways to get a better look. Meanwhile, in the living room, do you think they're ever going to come back downstairs? Peter asks MJ, who was sitting on his lap and flipping through the channels on the TV. It's probably going to be a few more hours. MJ says, knowing her mother very well. Has Ned texted you back yet? Yeah, his parents are still freaking out about everything and won't let him leave the house. Peter explains. Ned was supposed to return a couple of days ago, as he wanted to see everyone else's transformations, but his parents were a bit more shocked by his sudden change than they expected. First, Ned scared them by walking into the house in his new body, which made them think someone was robbing the place. Then, after defusing the situation and explaining everything, his parents were both shocked and scared. Obviously, they were shocked by his drastic change, but they were scared for a much different reason. The government. What would happen to their son if some secret government agency wanted to take him and use him for experiments or other unsavory activities? Although this train of thought wasn't wrong, as they live in a world full of people like this, it was mainly fueled by the many conspiracy theory shows and videos that Ned's parents watched daily. So, now Ned is under house arrest until a good amount of time passes that can explain his drastic change, which is probably for the best. Of course, Peter did not envy Ned's current situation one bit. He just got his powers and he can't even put them to use. MJ says, feeling sympathy for their friend. Yeah, it sucks but I can't say that I disagree with his parents. Peter says with a shrug. A couple of hours later, both May and Grace came strutting downstairs in some new clothes, which looked to be older than their normal outfits. It's been so long since these jeans fit me. May exclaimed as she and Grace entered the living room with an air of confidence. I'm glad everything worked out the way you wanted it. Peter says with a smile, enjoying their good mood. Thankfully, May and Grace's change wasn't as drastic as Ned's, so they could pass their transformation off as simply changing their makeup style alongside new skin creams and hygiene products. After cleaning up and enjoying each other's company, Grace went home via a portal, as she had work in the morning. May had work as well, so she went off to bed with a radiant smile on her face, still happy about her new look. That only left MJ and Peter, who had nothing to do tomorrow since it was summer vacation. Can we go and patrol the city? MJ asks excitedly out of nowhere. Ah, uh, no. Peter denies, deflating her excitement in a single moment. Why not? She asks while directing her best puppy-eyed expression toward him. Because you don't have a disguise and you haven't fully tested your powers out yet. Peter explains with a shake of his head. I don't need you snapping some guy in half because you can't control your strength yet. Okay, then let's go and start testing. MJ says as her excitement returns once again. Sigh, fine. Peter says reluctantly, as he originally wanted to spend the rest of the night cuddled up in bed together. With a wave of his hand, a portal appears, leading to a dark underground room, filled with all sorts of contraptions held together by webs. What is this place? MJ asks as they step inside. My secret lair. Peter says as he walks over and dusts off some of the equipment. I made all of this to test my powers when I first started. Now it's your turn, I guess. Showing MJ what each machine did, Peter started her off on the bench press, where she nervously looked at the huge metal beams which were used as weights. Are you sure I can lift this? She asks with a worried look. Yeah, just give it a try. Peter says as he stands nearby just in case. Lifting the bar above her with ease, MJ's mouth drops wide open in shock as a smile blooms on her face. Good job. Peter says with a smile. Looks like you need more weight though. Hours later, when they tested everything from her strength to spider senses and wall crawling, MJ turned to Peter with an important question. Peter, which name do you think sounds better? MJ called out as she wiped some sweat from her brow. Silk or Spider Woman? Chapter 175, C-175 Silk. Silk or Spider Woman? MJ looks to Peter for an answer. MMM. Peter hums in thought. If I had to choose, Silk sounds the coolest. Spider Woman feels more like you just copied my name in a way. All right, Silk it is. MJ says with a smirk, remembering the blacked out hooded spider suit that her multiverse counterpart wore. How do I get a superhero suit like yours? I want mine in black though. Well, I can probably whip up something for you. Peter says after a second of thought. Really? MJ exclaims excitedly as she rushes over and grabs his arm. Yeah, just focus on getting your body under control for now. I'll work on making your suit in the meantime. Peter's words made MJ vibrate with excitement. How long will it take? She asks, ready to make her big debut. I'll have it done when you're ready. Peter said, instantly taking the wind out of her sails. Fine. It only took MJ about a week to fully test out her body and get her newfound abilities under control. As soon as she was up to Peter's standards, he portaled her to his room to receive her promised reward. Where is it? MJ rushed through the portal with an exciting pep in her step. It's been a week and all she could think about was her suit and her first patrol around the city. Hold on. Sighing at her behavior, Peter walked over to his closet and pulled out some black and white clothing. Is this it? MJ paces over and snatches the clothes from his hand. 
As soon as her hand touched the suit, gold spell circles and runes covered every inch of the suit. After a moment, the suit was sucked up into MJ's hand and disappeared. Ah, what happened? She asks in shock, looking back and forth between Peter and her empty hand. The suit is bound to you now. Simply think of it and the suit will appear, like mine. Peter explains. Okay. MJ mutters as she closes her eyes and concentrates on her new suit. Instantly, the outfit she's wearing is replaced by a brand new black and white superhero suit with small red accents. Seeing MJ looking down at her body in shock, Peter steps out of the way so she can use the tall mirror behind him. Oh my god. MJ says in awe and wonder. Her new spider suit is a mix between the ghost spider and silk suits. Everything below the shoulders is the silk suit while the hood and mask are a black version of the ghost spider suit. The mask has large white eyes with red outlines as well as a red design in the inner part of the hood. Add image if you want. So, did I do a good job? Peter asks as he stands beside her, admiring his work. It's perfect. MJ says in a daze. That's not all though. Your suit is pretty much a copy of mine. I just redid everything my teacher did to mine. Peter says, what does your suit do? She asks, tearing her eyes away from the mirror. I don't think you've ever told me. Well, it's made and enchanted to be resistant to most things, like water, fire, tearing, cutting, etc. Though don't get too cocky. Enough damage would be able to break through the suit. If it is torn or damaged, the suit will regenerate back to new after a short time. Remember, it's made to last, not as a sort of protective armor. Don't rely on it to stop every attack. Peter explains. Okay, anything else? MJ nods like an attentive student. Yes, just one more thing. Peter says as he takes out his phone and snaps a quick picture of her. Look at this. Peter turns the phone to her, showing MJ a picture of the room without her in it at all. The suit is invisible to all cameras, but you can turn that off and on at will. Just think of turning it off. Peter explains. MJ does as she was told and feels a slight vibration run through the suit. As the vibration disappears, Peter takes another picture and shows it to her. This time she was completely visible. Use that function when you're leaving to patrol and returning home. Peter explains his use of the anti-camera function. That way no one can track where you live and find out your identity. Wow, this is amazing. MJ praises as she takes the suit off with a single thought, returning her normal clothes. Ready to get out there. Peter asks, throwing MJ for a loop as she didn't expect him to say that. Yeah, but are you sure I'm ready? MJ asks, as he has been fairly protective of her during the past week. Sure, the only way to learn now is by doing. Peter says with a shrug. Over the week, Peter has taught her some hand-to-hand -hand combat, but she was still new and extremely inexperienced. Though that wasn't a problem for people with spider abilities. MJ would be able to dodge any attack with her enhanced body and spider senses, so no normal person would stand a chance. We can work on your combat skills over time, but until then you might as well get out there and learn through experience. Peter says as a wide smile forms on MJ's face. She thought that Peter would hold her back for a while longer, but that didn't seem to be the case. Can we go now? She asks as her suit appears on her body once again. Sure. Peter says with a knowing smile. I don't know if I can do this. MJ mutters nervously as she looks over the edge of a tall skyscraper. What happened to all of that excitement and confidence from earlier? Peter smiles behind her. I think that I left it at home. MJ says as she stands frozen at the edge of the roof. Well, let's go get it. Peter says as he reaches forward and places a hand on her back. Peter, what are you doing? MJ yells in fear, just giving you a little nudge. Peter says in her ear as he pushes her forward. Sometimes the baby birds need to be thrown out of the nest, so they can learn to fly. Peter. MJ screams as she falls forward and plummets off of the tall skyscraper. Standing at the edge, Peter watches MJ flail for a moment before leaping off behind her. Pulling his arms to his sides, Peter fell face first and caught up to MJ, who was still freaking out. Swing. Peter yelled over to her as he pointed to his wrist. You can do it. Of course, Peter would save her if she needed it, but he would only do so at the last second. Until then he would wait for her to save herself. Hearing Peter's words and seeing the concrete floor getting closer and closer, MJ raised a hand up over her head and shot a web from her wrist. Sadly, she didn't aim it anywhere, so instead of sticking to a building, the web shot into the sky and fell with her only moments later. F asterisk CK. MJ yelled as she continued falling. Good try. Peter smiled as he saw the ground getting a bit too close for comfort. With a wave of his hand, a portal opened below them. Falling through it, both Peter and MJ came out 800 feet higher. When MJ saw the portal appear, she thought it was over, but that seemed to be a misconception on her part. Peter merely bought her some more time. All right, try again. Peter calls out as they continue falling. I hate you. MJ yells back as she glares at Peter. I love you too. Peter says with a smirk. Growing used to the feeling of falling, MJ looked at her surroundings and found that she was surrounded by buildings on all sides. I can do this. MJ thought as she pointed her wrist ahead and shot a web. A white line shot from her wrist and connected to the building, causing a smile to appear under MJ's mask. Good, now grab the web and swing. Peter gives her some pointers as he shoots a web at the same building as well. Doing as she's told, MJ tightened her fist around the web and swung like Tarzan, narrowly missing the packed streets of New York City. 
Below them, the crowded sidewalks filled with people watched and recorded as Spider-Man alongside another unknown person swung lowly overhead. Good job, now keep up. Peter calls out as he chains his webs to maneuver around the city. After sloppily swinging for a few blocks, MJ was starting to get the hang of Peter's preferred form of transportation. In fact, she loved it. Woohoo. MJ laughed madly as she swung behind Peter, finding the experience similar to a roller coaster. Hearing his girlfriend's happy screams behind him, Peter smirked and found a place to land on a nearby rooftop. Landing perfectly with a flourish, Peter turned to see MJ miss the swing and hit the side of the building at full speed. Bang. Okay, maybe she needs more practice. Peter muttered as MJ wall crawled up the building. I heard that. As MJ climbed to the rooftop with a huff, a loud alarm could be heard from down the street followed by some automatic gunfire. Before Peter could say anything, MJ leaped off of the building and swung toward the danger without a second thought. She's going to be the death of me, Peter thought as he swung off behind her.